Aloha. Aloha kakahiaka. Uh, this is the actual first ever joint East West Center, East West Center Alumni International Conference and East West Center International Media Conference. Two events in one, really big ones. Um, if you'll remember, they're normally actually hosted in different countries in alternating years, but we're able to come home at the same time in the theme of Hawaii Reconnection. Is All right, well, the East West Center has over 68,000 alumni in 179 countries. That's a huge ohana. And we begin today's program with the procession of chapters with the East West, Session, uh, East West Center Association roll call. Come on in. We begin with Asia Pacific Leadership Program. Asian Studies Development Program. Australia. Beijing. Bhutan. Northern California. Southern California. Chandigarh, Chennai, Colombo, Dhaka, Faisalabad, French Polynesia, Hyderabad, Islamabad, Jakarta, Kansai, Karachi, Lahore, Latin America, Manila, Media Programs, Mumbai, Nagoya, New Delhi, New York, New Zealand, Okinawa, Pan Pacific, Seoul, Singapore, Taipei, Tokyo, Ulan Batar, Washington, D.C., 
Yangon. And our host chapter, Hawaii! I feel like this is the Olympics. <laughs> welcome, welcome to all of our chapters. Thank you so much. What a beautiful show of these Nobori flags representing our growing Ohana. Uh, so happy to see these long-standing chapters with brand new ones. Four were born last year. Bhutan, New Zealand, Australia, and French Polynesia. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much. A wonderful network around the world. Thank you again for coming and celebrating with us. It's so nice to know that we are not alone in this world that we are <laughs> covering and navigating in these crazy times. I did also want to acknowledge Senator Hildehein is here. Hello, please wave. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Okay, well again, this morning's lineup was really curated to give you interwoven and distinct perspectives on this region that we call home. I'm now pleased to bring up President Suzanne Varez Loom to the stage. You know, it's an exciting time. This is our first time as an alumni community to have this open for our alumni conference, for you to open our alumni conference. And for most of us, it's the first time actually meeting you since you took office in January um, and, and took over this role. So we are so honored that you are leading our institution. That means so much to us, um, as our IMC friends know. Uh, but to share again with our alumni attendees, um, Susie is actually uh, the president of the East West Center, and she took up the role in January of this year. The first woman, first Native Hawaiian and Hawaii resident in this role. So I. Uh, Talk about representation. Better. Please welcome Ms. Susie Varez Loom. Mahalo Nui, Annalisa, and wow, that was very moving with the flags coming in. I gotta admit, I got a little choked up there. Hele mai kahikina, hele mai ke kaulana e akane. Come from the east, Come from the West. Hele mai a ike mai ke kahi ike kahi. Come together to understand one another. Hele mai me ka ike. Come together with knowledge. Hele mai me ke aloha. Come together with aloha. And that's you coming together, our ohana of the East West Center. To all of our distinguished guests here, our donors, our sponsors, as well as our staff and volunteers and our alumni who are here that came down with those flags from every part of the globe, that we come together, hell am I, to be here right now and representing 62 years of incredible relationships. And that's what it's about. That's what it has been. We are that bridge, all of us, across the Pacific, through the Indian Ocean, across the continent and the Atlantic and beyond. You know, in Hawaii, you hear the word aloha a lot, and that inspires me. People often think of it as a greeting, but alo means presence, and ha means breath. Together, it means the presence of breath or breath of life. It is working with care and compassion for each other. It is really approaching each other with kindness, patience, respect, and empathy. And I have seen the Aloha spirit here this week 
throughout the East West Center, and I know you have, whether you came from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, you came back here because you feel and you, want, you live that aloha spirit. So we've had extraordinary speakers like Maria Ressa, panels made up of many of you here with extraordinary experience. I feel um, like I wish I could thank each and every one of you here because when I look at the array of talent from around the world, I am overwhelmed and, uh, I, and, I, and the support that has been incredible. So I would like to just really highlight uh, a couple as an example, because each of you have a story. And every interaction, as I said, whether you found your loved one here, or you saw your picture up there, Representative Ward, when you were in the 1960s, uh, you, you, maybe you saw those pictures, and maybe you were looking for yourself, because you remember your young self uh, being here. So right now, uh, before I call up these two alumni, exceptional, um, that who exemplify the vision that I've been sharing, that the East-West Center would be a premier institution that really equips a network of leaders to come together to solve challenges of common concern, those challenges you heard this week and that you'll continue to hear in our other panels. Our first um, alumni that I want to uh, introduce before I ask them to come up here is uh, Catherine Kitty Pilgrim. Um, our next uh, a uh, panelist, another East West Center alum, distinguished, is Nirmal Ghosh. Is this Here we go. Wonderful. Well, thank you both so very much for joining us on stage. I, you know, things I believe work out for a reason. While we miss Dr. Campbell, we have now an opportunity to hear a representation of your voices as alumni. You know, so I really wanted to ask them a few questions. And at the same time, have you, at Participate by reflecting as you hear their answers. What would be your answer? And share it with someone else, because I think that's what this is about. So I want to start with uh, the first question, and maybe, Kitty, you could start, is if you could tell us about your East-West Center experience and how it impacted your life and career. It's such a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for asking me. And I am so delighted to meet all of you this time here in Hawaii. It's been a wonderful experience. It's always a wonderful experience to be here with the East West Center. And um, my first encounter with East West was with the Hong Kong Journalism Fellowship. I was at CNN and I was in, based in New York uh, doing mostly security economic issues. When you're in New York, you look towards Europe often and you're very focused on NATO and the Wall Street and the entire world that goes in that direction. I had always been very interested in Asia, and so when I had the opportunity to come, I took it very quickly. And I had a wonderful experience. We traveled to China and Hong Kong. I met many, many wonderful people. And because I was able to take uh, a trip around an area that I didn't know, it broadened my understanding of the stories that I was telling. And as China emerged as a global player in economics, I was so grateful for the experience that I had uh, in going around talking to thought leaders and many people in China and Hong Kong, and also many of my participants in the program who had different viewpoints. I joined CNN because I felt that communication, understanding other people, other cultures was very important. CNN in the information age was a breakthrough in that people were talking globally. It was the first time people were actually talking globally. I believe in that. That's important for peace. And so the Hong Kong Journalism Fellowship really helped me to understand China. I also participated in the Korean uh, journalism exchange and had the opportunity to travel through Korea. That was particularly valuable to me because I was very involved in security issues and reporting on security issues, and I could start to understand the North-South Korean conflict. And I learned enormous amount on that trip. And every time I came back from 
my travels in Asia, and also I lived in Japan for a while. So I had covered a lot of the bases. So every time I came back, I just knew more about the world, and that's a very, very valuable experience for a journalist. And I really owe it all to East West Center. Thanks so much, Kitty. Re you were really a bridge from that experience. You were bridging the world from that experience in Asia to the United States and then to Europe. Well, thanks for that. So, Nirmal, I wondered if you could share uh, about your East West Center experience and how it impacted your career. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and aloha, and namaste, and sawadikrap, all of you. Um, thanks for calling me up here. Um, you know, what struck me was your words about being, uh, you know, multiracial and so forth, so forth, and yours about being a globalized world. I'm personally multiracial. My mother was German. My father was Bengali. I was born and raised in India. I've worked, as you, as you noted, in Singapore, Manila, um, back in Delhi, then Bangkok, and Washington DC these last five and a half years, covered so many countries. And uh, I, I believe that um, much has been made of globalization, you know, the word globalization in the last few years, recent years. But I believe uh, globalization or being global is in the human DNA. I grew up uh, reading uh, the, the books of uh, Thor Heyerdahl, the Kontiki and Ra expeditions. I've been to Angkor, which where Indian kings built the temples of Angkor, the Alhambra in Spain was, is Arabic architecture. Global, um, more recently, the um, book Crossing the Bay of Bengal by Sulil Amrit, and he showed that there was more migration across the Bay of Bengal than across the Atlantic. So I really believe that um, we, we have, we are, globalization is in our DNA. And uh, my first experience of the East West Center, I'd heard of it, of course, but I was a Jefferson Fellow in 2016 in the summer. I went to Japan, went to China, and uh, I was based in Bangkok at the time. And it is essential to, I, I found it, it, it sort of plugged an essential gap in our understanding, which, because it's very important to go to other communities Wherever we report as foreign correspondents, we must be perpetual foreigners. We cannot be uh, sort of allow ourselves to sink into this kind of bubble of a capital city, of a country, right? So it's important to go out there to the ground, not only in uh, the country you're operating, but if you're working on international uh, affairs, analyses, and so forth, to go to other countries and understand, put yourself in the shoes of those other nations and understand uh, how they function, how they see the world. And um, certainly the Jefferson was a remarkable experience. And then I had a second, to my good fortune, I had a second fellowship, which was in the 2016 uh, presidential campaign in the US. I was a uh, presidential election reporting seminar fellow. And that was also remarkable because we saw you know, a range of political rallies, met a range of uh, um, experts and uh, were able to speak to Americans across the spectrum. And it was a fascinating crash course and insight into this, and into the amazing diversity and, uh, of the United States itself, which again, you know, every country is seen from the outside as through, through a prism of cliches, you know, Hollywood films or, you know, New York, Manhattan skyline, that kind of thing. But when you go out and, 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 and see the real world, so to speak, it gives you a completely new perspective and that's essential for our work. Thank you so much. Globalizations in our DNA. Well, clearly in this group here who believe in the international community. And so thank you for that. I wondered if we could shift to another question um, that if you could share your journey. So when you were younger, did you imagine that you'd have the career that you have today or that you experienced over the years? And maybe we'll start with Kitty again for that. No, I never dreamed. So you have to understand that when I was in college, CNN was not invented. And so I always laugh at people who have this great big game plan, because there's going to be something out there that's invented that you will connect to that will form your life. And when um, I was doing an internship at the US Embassy in Brussels, and 
I was sort of tracking for a career in diplomacy because I believe that dialogue is important, that understanding is important, that talking is important, that all wars, we hear this now all the time, all wars end at the negotiating table, all wars end in talking. Why not start talking first? So I felt very strongly about diplomacy. And I was in the uh, embassy in Brussels, very young, and we were in the cafeteria. And as I said, CNN had not been invented when I was in college. This was just after when I was doing my graduate degree. And there was a television monitor up on the ceiling. And I looked up and there was some broadcast and everyone was watching it as they collected their lunch. And I asked the person in line ahead of me, what is that? And he said, it's CNN. And I said, what's CNN? And he said, it's a new global channel, 24 hours a day news in English. And a light bulb went off in my head and I said, my God, that's what's going to change the world. If everyone is listening to a broadcast in English that's accessible, we're going to be able to communicate so much better. I left my internship, went straight back to New York, demanded an interview at CNN, which had, I think, 25 people. And they offered me a job, which they didn't really have. And I was allowed to type the names of the guests on the overnight shift from midnight to eight. This is with a master's degree in international relations. And they were offering me $11,000 a year. And I took the job because I knew that that would be a game changer. Now, my mother was not happy that I threw over my career in diplomacy for this, but it happened to work out. And, um, and I still believe strongly in the power of communication. So do I believe that there is something out in your future that will, you will connect to? If you maintain the integrity of your principles, mine were communication, peace, diplomacy, understanding, there will be something you will connect to eventually out there. One of the things that might put you in the right place are programs like this because you will start to expand your horizons very vastly as you do these programs. Thank you, Kitty. Make, we're filming this, all right? This is great, great use, use for um, sharing the power of this programs. So Nirmal, if you could also share with us, if you could share your journey again, and also um, when you were younger, did you imagine that you'd have this career today? No, I didn't imagine it, but I did sort of, I suppose, dream about it. You know, when I was a kid, you mentioned my wildlife, my other half of my life is uh, wildlife and environment. And when I was a kid, I went out to remote areas because my parents to the jungles. I, I read uh, books about adventures in Africa. I read all the great mountaineering classics about the Himalayas and so forth. Um, and then when I grew older, I read uh, books like The Great Game, Hopkirk's The Great Game, and that just, you know, the, the, the adventure sort of uh, was attractive to me. But I started my, I always wanted to be a writer, but I started my career in marketing for media organizations because it was, an, it was a foot in the door. And then uh, the first chance, I, I was writing all along, and then the first chance, I wrote a book on wildlife, and then the first chance I got, I switched to actual journalism. And um, I sort of, it was like stepping on a train and without a destination, really. Uh, it was just the adventure which lured me. And I just, you know, when you're young, the runway is endless. So when uh, I was offered foreign assignments and I was working with the Business Times in Singapore, a sister paper, uh, I started doing foreign assignments on a regular basis. I went all over the place, all over Asia, and uh, uh, the Philippines, uh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka. I met Arthur C. Clarke in Sri Lanka, which was, you know, I met all these people and the job sort of offers you opportunities to meet people you would never actually meet if you were doing something else. You know, amazing people you meet all the time. So it was just really the adventure and no, I didn't, uh, I sort of dreamed about it and I still do, although the runway is possibly a little shorter now. <laughs> but um, yeah, and it opened up new worlds and um, I just took to it and I just kept going to wherever the next, you know, 
to where, wherever the train was headed. And uh, it's been the most, really the most rewarding, I have to say, the most rewarding life. Of course, as a foreign correspondent, as we well know, you see a lot of beautiful things. You go to a lot of beautiful places. You meet amazing people. You see a lot of sadness and grief and horror and tragedy and violence as well, which is also something you have to live with. But uh, that informs, you know, our existence and our work. And I think it's a very important, I believe in the, in the traditional mission of, uh, of uh, journalists to inform. Um, and you can write opinions and have your own opinion and all that kind of thing, but the basic mission is to inform and bring all, all the, the, the whole spectrum of human existence and politics and geopolitics and all that to a wider audience so that people know what's you know, going on in the larger world. Well, thanks for that. You know, I have this image of Kitty on the, on the playground since I asked when they were younger. People are getting ready to have a little brawl and she's standing there can we talk? <laughs> and uh, I, I just have this image of Nirmal just jumping on the train. Yes, where's this gonna go? Very exciting. So, you know, I have a final question and if we have time, we can open it up for questions in the audience, but what advice, we have a lot of younger people here as well as uh, more seasoned like ourselves. Um, what would you have advice for emerging journalists or even some of our, we have some of our APLP um, participants in here and those online. What would you have told your younger self that you wish you would have known back then? I think these days we hear a lot about opinions in journalism and this is the great debate. Should opinions be in journalism? And I think that we should all let go of our opinions because once you hold an opinion, you're solidifying your input. You're, you're not allowing new things to come in. So my advice to anyone in this field, in the field of journalism or policy, is to let go of your opinions. I think that the, there's a progression of action that should happen. And this is the advice I would give myself at a younger age. In journalism, you must understand the issues first. So you study very hard to understand the issue first. Read everything you can get, talk to everyone you can. Then form the right questions to broaden your view of this issue. So asking the right questions is the operative way and that involves engaging with other people. When you do that as a journalist, you understand the issue, you ask the right questions, you get, hopefully, to something resembling the truth. In policy, which I'm also very involved in, it is the same process, and we seem to forget that. You have to understand the issue, you have to broaden your perspective by going out and getting different viewpoints, that could be globally, that could be domestically, that could be in your own neighborhood, and then you ask the right questions, broaden your insight, and then come to a solution. So journalism, hopefully the end result is the truth, and policy is a solution. And that is the sort of rope that I would hold on to and give myself uh, sort of something to hold on to when I was younger. I've arrived at this equation a little bit later in life, but it serves me well. Thank you, Kitty. Great point. Nirmal? If you... Well, I'm tempted to say what she said, but, <laughs> <laughs> but um, essentially I would say keep an open mind, have an open mind. Your mind should be um, a blank canvas and you have to read a lot of books. I would suggest to read a lot of books, but then when you say read a lot of books about a particular country, then you go to that actual country and explore it and then you have to almost, it's almost like you unlearn everything you read and learn all over again. But really the two things complement each other and uh, do not be quick to rush to judgment. Although there is a certain moral clarity which must inform your work at, at particular times, right? When you're covering, for example, atrocities or something, there has to be some 
element of moral clarity. But otherwise, in general, it's, it's the most critical thing I would say, and I would echo you, is, um, is to keep an open mind and uh, just receive every, all the input that comes to you and, um, and, and, and enjoy the learning experience. That's all. Thank you so much. Well, reserving our opinion, asking the right questions, keeping an open mind so that you can seek clarity and truth, the best truth that you can possibly find. Well, you both collectively have incredible experiences and we're so grateful that at the very last moment we've asked them because of Dr. Campbell, but we couldn't have asked for a better pair of alumni up here representing all the alumni here. But I think this is a sample, your life, your experience, your words, the way that you've impacted people's lives that maybe you don't even realize you have, those people you'll never meet that saw your broadcast, read your paper, that can never tell you thank you, that um, you are a sampling of all of you out here. I'm sure much can be said about everyone in this audience. So thank you. Thank you for gracing us with your presence, being here, and enlightening us all. Let's give them a round of applause, please. Thank you again. Now we are um, about to move into the next part of our, our program. And um, it's so wonderful to um, be able to introduce our next portion. And I think just now we have our undersecretary of state, Liz Allen, who is here. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Secretary, for being here. So wondered to have you have perfect timing. You timed this perfectly because we're just about to introduce your panel. So, of course, it is my honor now to transition and introduce our next moderator and speaker. Mr. Steve Herman is our moderator, and it has been a pleasure to meet him virtually and also meet him and see him on a panel this week. Um, he is the chief national correspondent of the Voice of America, and we're so grateful for that organization. And of course, we are delighted to have our next speaker, the Undersecretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs, Ms. Elizabeth Allen. She comes with us with incredible experience, over 15 years of strategic communications and public affairs experience. Um, Secretary Allen specializes in message strategy, project and crisis management and leadership communications. We are so delighted to have you. Thank you for making the journey. And please join me in wel welcoming our Undersecretary Elizabeth Allen. Thank you, it's my pleasure to do that. Good morning. Happy day three to our media participants who I know have been here for a few days and welcome to the East West Center alumni. Um, I wanna thank the East West Center for having me. It is a real pleasure um, to be here. We do a lot of work with the East West Center at the Department of State. Um, it, is a, it is a place where relationships and ideas flourish and it is an honor to be here. I am so glad to make the trip um, with this illustrious gathering and the conversations that you all are having this week. It's critically important in my view for the US government to show up, talk about our perspective and what we're doing, and I'm really excited to be here today. It's also an honor, of course, to be preceded by so many incredible thinkers and practitioners, including Maria Reza, who I know you all heard from on Tuesday. And while many of you may know her as a Nobel laureate, we at the State Department also know her as an alumna of our Fulbright program, which is our preeminent academic exchange program for people around the world. She, of course, is an extraordinarily courageous champion of freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of digital future, freedom of our digital future, and that's the digital future that's free and open that we want to build together. I also just want to note, um, as um, a very generous introduction noted, um, I've worked in communications in and out of government for my whole career, and as a point of personal privilege, it has been an honor to work alongside journalists for that for that career. And I am deeply, deeply respectful of the work you do and the role you play in democratic societies. And so that deep respect 
and understanding that we all have a role to play in upholding democratic principles is the context with which I come to this conversation today. Um, and the president, President Biden, of course, has noted that the future of each of our nations, and indeed the world, depends on a free and open Indo-Pacific, enduring and flourishing in the days ahead. And that indeed is what underpins our US government approach to the Indo-Pacific region and our foreign policy there. Indeed, the United States is committed to deepening our relationships in the Indo-Pacific and supporting a region that is secure, connected, prosperous, and resilient. And I think of those, those four attributes, the connected part is the part that we're gonna talk about here today. It is sometimes the most under-discussed as we all think about our security and economic equities in the Indo-Pacific. But frankly, it's the connections between people and communities that are necessary to build enduring strength, openness, and freedom. And so in order to build that strength, openness, and freedom, we are taking a hard look at the existing and emerging challenges throughout the region. That has led us to commit to investing in democratic institutions and the rule of law, the protection and promotion of human rights, a free press, and a vibrant civil society. It has led us to our commitment to expose corruption and drive reforms in this space, and a commitment to advancing common approaches to promoting the development, deployment, and governance of critical and emerging technologies such that their adoption improves people's lives and strengthen rather than weakens democratic and civic institutions and fosters rather than degrades truth, which I know is what you all have been talking about here this week. We are quite clear-eyed about the threats posed by those who envision a future in which media freedom is constrained, that freedom of expression is criminalized, the flow of information is stymied, and that civic institutions should be hollowed out rather than bolstered. And we know that we cannot and should not face these threats and solve these problems alone. It's exactly the fact that we have to tackle these challenges together that I'm so grateful to be here today and value the opportunity to have a dialogue about it. The challenges we are now facing in the information environment are complex and dynamic enough that there are very few perfect answers, which you all know to be true. But we are better off for this opportunity to exchange ideas increase understanding of each other, and build solutions together. So just a bit on the problem, which again, we know well. But it's important to think for you all to know how we're thinking about this as a very much a 360 problem from the US government standpoint. We know we're here to talk about restoring trust in a zero trust world. And I am certain that over the last two days, you've had rich conversations about many of the problems that weigh against trust. But I'm gonna challenge the premise, and proudly so. I'd like to say, I don't believe we are operating in a zero trust world. Quite the opposite. I think people still want to trust. I think actually, in fact, we are seeing people desperately trying to seek the truth. And it's actually that it's much harder to find it and to know who to trust than it is that people don't want to be able to trust. They want to actively seek out places and sources of information that they deem accurate and trustworthy. And that's very much where we think our role as a US government comes in using our credible voice to spread truth and lifting up other voices across the world to do the same. Every day, my team, which includes about 1,500 people in DC and very proudly 4,000 uh, public diplomacy foreign service officers and locally employed staff at US embassies around the world, some of whom are here today, they work to foster a more truthful world. We are deeply proud of the work. We take it very responsibly. We know that trust must be earned and that hard truths must be addressed with honesty. As Secretary of State Tony Blinken, our boss, says, quote, if the United States is not engaged, if we are not trying to lead, then one of two things is happening. Either someone else or no one else and that's usually, is leading, and that usually leaves a vacuum that's filled by bad things before it's filled by good things. So we at the Department of State are actively monitoring the escalating assault on trust in our institutions, on truth, and as well as the real and dangerous implications for society, civility, and livelihood. And of course, as we know, among the most pressing threats to trust are the efforts of adversaries to manufacture and spread disinformation. In the Indo-Pacific region, in addition, to, in addition to mis- and disinformation flowing in from private citizens in other countries, including, unfortunately, the United States, we are obviously all confronted by the PRC actively working to constrict, suppress, and contort the free flow of information. 
a topic I know that's come up all week. What we now call the information space has always been a theater of competition. But today, however, as you all well know, technology has enabled actors with malign intent to both precisely target individuals and spread disinformation on a global scale. So we have to think about how to combat both. While technology offers a platform for the previously voiceless to be heard, and a place for like-minded people to find each other across borders, of course a good thing, we also know it's misused by authoritarian regimes to extend their repression as they seek to silence voices that might speak truths they don't want heard. And those committed to sharing the truth, including researchers and journalists like many of you, are under some of the most acute pressure both online and offline, and we are tracking it closely. We know that according to the Committee to Protect Journalists, not only were 293 journalists behind bars for doing their jobs by the end of 2021, but we've obviously seen an uptick in legislation that criminalizes press and free expression, particularly in the Indo-Pacific region. So that's the problem. And I wanna talk a little bit today about what we're doing about it at the State Department and on behalf of the US government. The first thing I wanna talk about is the government's responsibility to tell the truth. At the State Department, we are committed to telling the truth about the world as we see it, the world that we see evidence for, the things that we witness. It's why we laid out the pretext of Putin's invasion of Ukraine. It's why we have called on the PRC to end the Uyghur genocide. We know that we have to communicate with honesty, with credibility, and with clarity to strengthen our partnerships and to build engagement worldwide in every corner of societies. Our fierce defense of the free press, of transparent elections, and of the protection of civil liberties, like the fundamental freedoms of expression and peaceful assembly, are at the core of our values, home and abroad. These are the bedrocks of democracy and at the heart of a vibrant, trustworthy information environment. And I have to say, as a democracy in constant evolution ourselves, we are clear-eyed about our own shortcomings. We remain committed to being open and honest about those shortcomings, about where we are and where we're looking to go. We're committed to communicating truthfully, even when the truth is hard to face. So one of the most powerful things we can do as a State Department and as a US government, as a matter of the democratic principles that underpin our foreign policy, and is exactly what our adversaries will not do, is tell the truth. Tell difficult truths. And being able to speak truthfully, and more important, to be heard and believed, all depends on being able to engage people and build trusting relationships. And that's where a lot of our public diplomacy work comes in. As was mentioned, I'm the Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy. People often ask, what is that? Quite simply, it is engaging people around the world. It's the work of engaging communities, of building relationships, all to make sure that we are progressing forward as societies around the world. So the work of our public diplomacy really comes in when it comes to building trust. Building people-to-people people -people connections through a variety of programs and platforms is one of the best ways to build trust amongst individuals, organizations, and governments. Those connections that are essential to forging meaningful interactions in a crowded and contested information space. You all know this. People trust their dentist, their weatherman, and their neighbor more than they trust a lot of other people in the information space. So we have to make sure that communities of people and neighborhoods of people are talking to each other and feel empowered to speak truth to power. Today, more than ever, we need to make sure that these people-to-people -people connections feel urgent. Relationships between and within communities to build a foundational fabric of building trust. So we're focusing intensely on building these networks, which I'll talk more specifically about in just a little bit. But we also know that we have to shape the environments and platforms where people are having conversations. And that's where a lot of our work countering disinformation and shaping 21st century technology comes in. As a public diplomacy practitioner, I do this work with my colleagues in the cyberspace, in the emerging technology space, in the, uh, in the labor and free internet and free uh, media space. We are all working together to put free media, free internet, and a, and a responsible use of emerging technology on the, di on the diplomatic agenda with our colleagues and in our priorities with civil society to know that we cannot do this alone, we have to do it together. Through the Declaration for the Future of the Internet, the Freedom Online Coalition, and other critical efforts, the United States is working with our partners and allies to promote an open, free, global, interoperable, reliable, and secure internet. Easy, right? <laughs> we know that we need a rights-respecting digital ecosystem. 
And in our efforts to prevent and respond to the misuse of digital technologies, we are taking on the rampant disinformation, inhibiting honest communication and meaningful dialogue. In an effort to counter disinformation and empower people with the tools and technology know how to do it themselves, we are working in coordination with other countries as well as journalists, NGOs, and others in civil society to build this capacity, like I said. The department's Global Engagement Center lives in our public diplomacy world, and we have people from the Global Engagement Center here with us today. Their work is to identify and expose disinformation and the techniques used by those who are propagating it. They are testing technologies with journalists to validate original content online, and they're supporting the development of innovative programs and technologies to empower people to take on disinformation themselves, including, for example, helping give grants for young people to de design online games that help identify and expose disinformation. It sharpens players' abilities to discern, in, discern disinformation in digital content. We know we have to meet people where they are in terms of the platforms and ways that they're communicating with people, and we are endeavoring to do that. We are also continuing to partner with the Digital Communications Network. This is our flagship counter disinformation network building program. We started in Europe after the 2014 invasion of Crimea by Russia at that point. We now have a digital communications network in Eastern Europe, across Africa, and this fall we'll have one in Latin America. This is, this is a program where we and the US government sponsor people to go through training and programs and empowerment to become responsible voices on digital platforms themselves. We're lifting up civil society leaders and others who are trusted voices in their own community to understand how to talk about values and priorities and democratic progress. We have over 800, excuse me, we have over 8,000 digital users right now, and like I said, when we expand to Latin America, we'll have quite a few more. On the ground, it's also important to note that those embassies I spoke about, where we have teams of public diplomacy officers, they are finding creative ways to empower youth to fight disinformation as well. Partnering with think tanks, endeavoring to translate things into local language, knowing that we don't have the luxury of English speakers everywhere, although we're certainly trying to increase English language access to communities that want it. And we're empowering governments to respond to censorship, disinformation, and more, particularly those governments um, that are struggling democracies or, or building their, their democratic strengths. But to go back to the networks I talked about before, and this is our bread and butter of our work, the heart of trust, we think, is relationships. And we must focus on forging deeper connections and tighter networks with our partners and in investing in community leaders and young people who will shape the future. As just one example, relevant to many home countries of some of the journalists here today, we know that the majority of the population in Southeast Asia are under the age of 35. And so one of our flagship programs in the US government is called the Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative, or YSEALI. YSEALI through YSEALI, we are engaged in a multi-year effort to harness the extraordinary potential of youth in the region. We are empowering them through exchanges and training and programming with each other, both digitally and in person, to address critical challenges in their own countries, the issues that they find meaningful and that they want to tackle. And we're hoping to expand opportunities for generations to come. In fact, we just doubled the YSEALI program from the United States government at our recent ASEAN Leaders Summit. It was one of our chief deliverables to be able to say that not only are we investing in the security equities and the economic equities in, in ASEAN, but we are also deeply investing in the young people and the leaders of the future, because we know that that will be the backbone of trust and advancing democratic principles. We also have a Young Pacific Leaders Program, which is another youth-focused initiative with youth from across the Pacific Islands, Australia, and New Zealand. I am having lunch with some of them today, and I am very excited to hear from them how they are benefiting from our programs, what challenges they are seeing in their communities, and how can we as a government partner with them and enable with them to go be the change that they need to see. We are giving grants to them to tackle education, environment, resource management, civic leadership, economic, and social development. One project, just to give you a sense, the Tongan Youth Media Camp facilitated a four-day retreat for hands-on media training and discussion and analysis of current events. The retreat focused on skill building and video production, leadership communications, and media advocacy. We know that not only do we need to equip journalists and citizen journalists with, the, with empowerment to talk about issues they care about and to do investigative journalism, but also to give them technical skills and also to give them resilience tools against, as we've talked about, increasing oppression of free expression and civil rights. Speaking of media advocacy, this is where I want to end. Media advocacy and supporting the fourth estate in terms of 
empowering journalists, fighting for internet freedom, and fighting for media freedom is a bedrock in fostering truth. We know this. We have to protect and uplift a free press. In fact, Secretary Blinken sat down with Maria Reza last month uh, for RightsCon, which um, some of you may be familiar with, um, in partnership with the Atlantic Council as well. And they discussed views on protecting human rights online and advancing democratic progress through media freedom. Central to that discussion was issues such as defending a free press, protecting journalists, and bolstering our work with allies and partners to push back on digital authoritarianism. As Secretary Blinken said in that conversation, quote, we all have to be seized with the fierce urgency of now. He remarked that civil society, NGOs, the private sector, and independent media must work together, along with governments, to ensure that our shared technology-enabled future advances human freedom and dignity, rather than constraining and rolling back hard-earned democratic progress. I know how important a free press is to a transparent functioning institution, and that strengthening trust at all levels can only be accomplished through a free and truthful press. A healthy fourth estate depends on talent and unrelenting commitment, but it also requires attention and resources. We know this. We are resourcing media around the world as the US government. We are lifting up outlets that need assistance to keep going in oppressive environments. The president is prioritizing this, and we at the State Department are meeting the challenge. Just two weeks ago at the G7 media ministers meeting in Bonn, Germany, G7 governments reaffirmed our commitment to a free and open media environment, open, free, global, interoperable, reliable, and secure internet, and resilient telecommunication services. We are united in our opposition to government-imposed internet shutdowns and other restrictions, support for journalists and media professionals, and commitment to promoting access to independent media, especially in regions hit hard by war and crisis, which we know is the case throughout the Indo-Pacific. The State Department is promoting and protecting open and resilient information ecosystems by addressing the needs of at-risk journalists. We have made a number of commitments to advance media freedom and the protection of journalists, and I will spare you the laundry list of things, but I do want to highlight just a few that we think are critically important to protecting the press going forward. The first is our commitment to up to $3.5 million for the launch of, journal of a journalism protection platform. This provides at-risk journalists with digital and physical security training, psychosocial care, legal aid, and forms of assistance. And I point this out because note that it is not editorial training, it is not enabling investigative journalism, all of which is important. It is giving the emotional, physical, and security needs of journalists across the world their due attention, knowing that it is harder than ever to be a journalist in most places in this world and to operate freely. We are also bolstering our engagement with the Media Freedom Coalition, which is a multilateral partnership to advance media freedom and the safety of journalists worldwide. And finally, we are supporting our partners at USAID to establish the International Fund for Public Interest Media to enhance the independence, development, and sustainability of independent media globally. As Secretary Blinken noted in his remarks to journalists at the Foreign Press Center in Washington, D.C. in May, on World Press Freedom Day, he said, a vibrant, independent press is a cornerstone for any healthy democracy. And that is the North Star with which we design our programs, which we try to empower communities, and it's the core to the idea that information is a public good, crucial to everything we do and to every decision that we make. It's also integral to our support of and pursuit of the transparency and truth that we've all been discussing this week. So just to say, and then we'll take a few questions, we're at a critical moment that demands we take stock of the changing media landscape, engage in a dispassionate assessment of what's working and what's not working, and acknowledge our roles in collective successes and failures. Trust is earned, we know this and it starts with honesty and humility from where we sit. Government depends on civil society leaders, public activists, and committed journalists like many of you to hold your institutions and governments accountable, and we welcome that. We in the United States government are committed to safeguarding the truth, and we are ready, must be ready, and willing to meet your collective challenge by prioritizing truth, defending truth tellers, and providing clear, credible information to the people we represent and to people around the world. So I look forward to taking a couple questions and having a more lively discussion. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Aloha, welcome. Aloha. We are thrilled to have you here, Liz. Um, no pressure, you are the uh, senior US official yes. um, with Kurt Sorry, Campbell's Dr. absence. Sorry, Dr. couldn't make it. <laughs> and uh, we opened, as you mentioned, with a uh, Nobel Peace Prize laureate. Yes. And uh, we're finishing with you, so no pressure. <laughs> here we are. You. Um, I had some very encouraging remarks uh, in your speech about 
boosting funding mm -hmm. uh, for media freedom programs, media training, the incredible Waisili program for Southeast Asia. And I'm sure everyone welcomes that. I want to tell you that during the panels we've had here, you touched on some things, as mm -hmm. you mentioned. Uh, there were a number of issues that came up. But one thing that really struck me as somebody who's been uh, in and out of the region for more decades than I want to acknowledge is there's a perception that in the last few decades, uh, especially in the South Pacific vis-a-vis -vis the North Pacific where the United States has strong geostrategic interests, there's compact free association, there's American territory, Guam, Hawaii, uh, et cetera, that um, the United States to a great degree has been missing in action. Mm -hmm. And they talked about uh, not only the United States and Australia, which had traditionally been in the region as well, missing, and that void being filled by China. Mm -hmm. And the number of students that go off to China to study, and someone said in their country, 30% of the bureaucrats now speak fluent Mandarin. Um, and they want the United States back. So, first of all, you were in the um, Obama administration. You obviously were not in the previous administration. You're back in the Biden administration. What happened from your perception, and what can and should this administration be doing to put the United States back in the game in the region? Well, thanks, Steve, for the question, and I also want to pay tribute to Steve's long illustrious career of being a journalist in many difficult places, including Washington, D.C., where it is not always easy to be a journalist indeed. Um, point very well taken on the South Pacific, particularly in the Pacific Islands, and to your point about where did America go, um, I think I can say conclusively America is coming back there. Um, focusing on the Pacific Islands in particular is something we are talking a lot about right now in the halls of the State Department. Um, it is a priority for us we know that the Pacific Islands have been um, a very contested theater of competition and influence and that China has done a lot. And that we know that we need to surge in resources, including economic and security, but frankly a lot of what I think about is resources to these community leaders and these young people I talked about, right? Um, so the Young Pacific Leaders Program I talked about specifically brings together youth from the South Pacific, including, as I mentioned, Australia and New Zealand. And I think that's been a really important program that's just recently got off the ground because, to your point, we are doing a lot in the North Pacific, we are doing a lot even in Southeast Asia, but we need to be doing more in the South Pacific. And so we are critically focused on that. I will say that from where I sit, we just put together our FY24 budget request, <laughs> a bureaucratic exercise if there ever was one, but actually, a budget exercise is really an opportunity to reflect what your strategic priorities are. And in our budget request, we are meaningfully asking for increasing resources in the South Pacific, and particularly in the Pacific Islands, when it comes to countering disinformation. We need to have people on the ground to counter disinformation. We need to be enabling a free press. We know that the PRC has made gains, particularly in buying media and exercising exclusivity contracts with PRC media in those islands, and that we are at a disadvantage right now as the United States that we are certainly looking to make up. So from a public diplomacy programmatic standpoint, this is absolutely a priority of ours. It's something that yesterday while I was at Indopaycom had a chance to talk to the Indopaycom commander about, Admiral Acalino. Our interests are aligned. I know that my Department of Defense colleagues are thinking a lot about our security footprint in the South Pacific. I know that my colleagues at the Department of Commerce and at the Department of State are thinking about what are we doing um, from an economic standpoint. We just announced the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. But from where I sit, what we can do is surge resources particularly into a free media, particularly into countering disinformation, and particularly into enabling young people to be working with each other to tackle these challenges. And I would also just say, Steve, because you asked sort of about the trajectory of this administration's policy, um, we recently had a high-level delegation of U.S. government officials, including Kurt Campbell and Assistant Secretary of State Dan Crittenbrink, who actually went to the Solomon Islands, who um, we are increasing our engagement there. We have announced that we are doing a high-level uh, strategic dialogue with the Solomon Islands. 
And Secretary Blinken was able to announce earlier this year that the United States is going to open diplomatic facilities in the Solomon Islands when he actually visited Fiji for the first time as a Secretary of State in decades. So you are seeing our footprint ramp up. We know this is a strategic priority. And I'm very proud to say that at least from the resources and the budget that I am focused on, we are surging resources into this space. Thank you. Liz has agreed to stick around, take a few questions. We have a limited amount of time. Also, if uh, we do get a question from online, I'd love to get a question right. from someone online as well. Uh, we'll call on um, a couple of folks here in the audience as well. Please, since we have very limited time, no uh, speeches, statements. <laughs> Be journalists, ask a good, sharp, concise question. And I see somebody right at the mic there. Uh, and please introduce yourself. It's hard for me to see, but uh, go for it. Um, my name is Mark Sheldon. I'm a retired academic teaching in Hong Kong for 41 years. Great. I was a earlier in my career, director of the Fulbright Commission in Hong Kong. It's wow, called, called the Hong Kong America Center, uh, now closed. Um, my question is sort of the elephant in the room about engagement with China. Mm -hmm. um, notwithstanding Kurt Campbell's assessment of US-China relations, I have to say that decoupling will never work. So my question to you is, how does the US government plan to re-engage with China. So this question in a way is directed at Susie as well. How will the East-West Center in the future re-engage with China? Um, decoupling in the long term will yeah. not work. Okay. Mark, thank you and thank you for your service on the Fulbright Commission. Um, I know I mentioned the Fulbright in my remarks. We are deeply proud of the program. Um, so let me just say a couple things. The, the spoiler alert answer to the very sharp specific question on when are we restarting the Fulbright program in China and Hong Kong is stay tuned. It is absolutely something we are actively assessing and working on. Um, there are some bureaucratic uh, reasons why it's not something that I can just make a decision and flip a switch on, but know that amongst our colleagues at the State Department and with the White House, it is something that we are actively talking about. So more to come, but it is absolutely on the radar. Let me just say very quickly, because I think it's critically important, I'm actually really glad that Mark raised this and framed it, because um, we actually, as a US administration, we just recently laid out a very comprehensive, long deliberated strategy on our approach to the People's Republic of China. And one of the most important things in the strategy and what we are, what we are saying and doing is the fact that we recognize that the PRC government is a much different entity and doesn't represent many people in China. And so our strategy and our approach and our uh, resource investments reflect that. We welcome Chinese students to the United States. That is, we are, the, we are a better country in the United States for that. We know that there's a demand for that, both for students to come from China and practitioners and academics and experts to come from China to the United States and vice versa. We don't have a choice but to work together in areas where we can identify cooperative solutions. And so we absolutely do have exchange programs that teach English language to uh, Chinese participants. We are sending US students to China regularly on a variety of programs, both to study, to learn Mandarin, um, and, and to exchange cultural ideas because the future does not. Um, the future does not look as if it is going. We're going to be bifurcated. To your point, and we certainly don't want that. And so, particularly in the public diplomacy space, there are a lot of areas of cooperation and exchange that we're going to continue. Thank you. Second in line, I believe, was the uh, gentleman over on this side over here. Thank you. I'm Shafiq Rahman. Hi. Uh, I teach in uh, South Carolina now. In 1978, 79, I was with East West Center as an intern in Communication Institute. My concern, my question to you is the source credibility and reliability that you mentioned, you know, we never heard the word, you know, false news or alternate facts or things in 1960s, 70s, 80s. Mm -hmm. It has become a really a major, major point now. Mm -hmm. Is there a real qualitative change in journalism? So, Thank you, and nice to meet you. Um, my sister lives in South Carolina, a lovely place to live. Um, 
So I think instead of casting blame, I would, I'll just share quickly how we think about tackling the problem about disinformation. Because um, to your point, what we've seen, particularly with the disaggregation of media and the profit incentives in media, um, the profit incentive is for eyeballs, and we have seen that some media outlets have used the weaponization of truth and information unto their profit motive, right? That's all I'm gonna say about that, but we know that that's happening in the background. Um, you know, what's so interesting is when I go around talking about disinformation or when people want to talk to me about disinformation, it's often talked about as just a messaging challenge. Oh, if we just counter the falsehood with the truth, people will believe us. That is not it. That is naive, it is not sustainable, and you cannot stop propaganda machines that are going to be propaganda machines. So we have to decide where best to invest resources to chip away at it. So I'll just offer quickly, our intrepid timekeeper is keeping us on time here. I'll offer quickly that when we think about disinformation, I'd encourage everyone to think about it as sort of a 360 ecosystem approach. You have a messaging component where there are certainly going to be narratives and issues and stories that are worth refuting directly. In fact, from the State Department, part of what we've done more sharply than ever during the Russia-Ukraine conflict is very clearly on our own attributed platforms lay out truth versus lie, fact versus fiction. Putin says this, this is the truth. And we do have to do a fair amount of counter-narrative, um, particularly when there are high stakes. But it's not just a messaging exercise, right? As we all know, it is also a media freedom exercise. To your point about whether, like, what role the media has to play, my judgment is that the media cannot, should not, and, and will not fix any of these problems alone, but they have a role to play, right? On my way out to Hawaii, my colleague and I stopped in Los Angeles and we met with the dean of the Annenberg School of Communications, and we had a really interesting discussion exactly about this topic. USC. Yes, USC. How are we training the next generation of journalists to be able to decipher and push back against disinformation without they themselves needing to bear the responsibility of being the arbiters of ultimate truth, which is ultimately probably not sustainable for most journalists and media outlets. But of course, media have a role to play. Then of course, we have the underpinning technology, right? And this is where we get into a free internet, an open free internet, not a splintered one, and one in which content moderation decisions and um, you know, internet freedom decisions are made thinking about how does information travel? And I will say that myself directly and members of my team are in regular discussions with social media companies and digital platforms on exactly these issues. You know, they are dealing with internet across the world that in some regions and in some countries, some of which you cover, the internet is being splintered or oppressed. And in other places, it's vibrant in free democracies. And so I, I am sympathetic with, um, you know, the challenges of precedent and, and universal challenge around internet freedom. Um, there's a lot more to say. The last thing I'll just say very quickly, Steve, and you're doing a great job, is um, I really just want to emphasize that when it comes to combating disinformation, we also have to play the long game. And that's why I, I spoke so much about network building and bolstering community leaders and young people because combating disinformation is not just a rapid response exercise. It is a long-term structural challenge that we need to invest in people's media literacy, digital literacy, and making sure that we are enabling credible voices and communities. I joked before about the dentist and the, and the weatherman, but I think we all know there's some truth in that, right? And so how are community leaders and civil society, society leaders being trained and being resourced to be arbiters of truth in their own communities? We think a lot about that long-term challenge. So if you can make your question very brief, sir, at the microphone. Uh, thank you, sir. My name is Mushtaq Sarki from Pakistan as Hi. a senior journalist and social activist. There are two parts of my question. One is a former Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan, have been removed from the seat after successful vote of no confidence in the parliament. Why he is still blaming US for his downfall? The other one, fuel prices and inflation rate is very high in Pakistan. When common people asking government through media, media channels, they are blaming IMF. So why IMF not releasing amount and funds for Pakistan? Is there an, uh, is any uh, conspiracy behind the CPEC and China support? Also, we can spend an hour on that too. Well, uh, if, if you want to make, I, I don't know whether the undersecretary can really address something about the IMF and a conspiracy in Pakistan, <laughs> but uh, if, Maybe you can use this opportunity to talk about uh, that has been another relationship that's been contentious over the years between U.S. and Pakistan. Any sort of engagement uh, with 
South Asia, and also what hasn't what was mentioned quite extensively during this conference were the challenges to the media in India mm -hmm. and um, the journalists being thrown in jail, and some perception, a more general question, that the U.S. is tamping down its messaging about human rights and these sort of violations out of geostrategic priorities. So how would, whether it's Pakistan or India yeah. or elsewhere, how would you respond to that? Thank, thanks for that question, and thank you, sir, for what you raised as well. Um, I think that's exactly right, um, that we know that this is a challenge, um, particularly in South Asia, and we are watching um, you know, this area of the world quite closely in terms of internet freedom and media freedom being oppressed. We know, and what underpins our engagement with these governments, is that any democratic society is the better off for increased freedom of expression and increased transparency and accountability between government and citizens. And that is what underpins our discussions with them. One point I think is important to make in the framing of this issue um, is that besides our messaging and talking about the fact that these are our values, this is part of our diplomatic agenda. So our US government officials are in touch with senior US senior government officials, both in India and Pakistan, about these issues. We cannot just talk about them. We have to press them in private settings as well. We are doing that. And we enjoy a very robust strategic partnership, both with India and with Pakistan. But we also make sure that we are talking about our values behind those closed doors as well, including on internet freedom and media freedom. Well, as you know, uh, we journalists don't like to just rely on the public statements and yeah. really want to know what is going on behind closed doors. And it's our job to sort of ferret that out. It out. Exactly. So thank you very much, Under Secretary Allen, for coming Pleasure here to today. Be here. Big round of applause. And it, it's been very enlightening, best of luck, and uh, I hope you get to individually visit uh, the countries from those of us um, who are here today. Thank you very much. You Mahalo. Thanks, everybody. I just, I really want to thank our, our undersecretary. You know, she brought up something about our Young Southeast Asian Leaders Program, and I'm really proud to say that you know, we just received after COVID our first group of young Southeast Asian leaders and they're, all 20 of them, it was their first time in the United States. And so they got to experience our 50th state here in Hawaii. Uh, and also wanted to mention as well, your points, um, our undersecretary, that, you know, in, in this room, we have 62 years of legacy investment, that long-term investment you're talking about, of people in here who have made a ripple impact on many lives. By investing in one, they have impacted so many through what they've done. And every single engagement with the people here, you hear in their voices the, the, the lives they've touched. So it is now my pleasure to introduce our next speakers for the next plenary session our moderator, as well as our guest speaker. So our moderator, I am proud to say, is our own vice president, Dr. Satu LeMay. He's the vice president of the East West Center, as well as the director of our center in Washington, DC. Please welcome Dr. Satu LeMay to come up on the stage to moderate. Well, thank you, Susie. Thanks very much. And can I just remark that today being June 30th is the six month mark of President Vera Slum's presidency at the East Center. So please join me in congratulating her. As you know, one other important institution other than the East West Center here on the Hawaiian Islands is Indo-PACOM, the Indo-Pacific Command. And absolutely delighted today to have with us the head of the strategic plans and policy part of Indo-PACOM, uh, Major General Chris McPhillips. I would take, would take too long to tell you all about his experiences, his service to the country, his command experience, et cetera. So let me flag uh, three or four things that I think are really important for you to know before he gives his remarks. One, he's a Marine. So that tells you something right there and then. <laughs> Second, he's an aeronautical engineer. And third, he is uh, an, a scholar of sorts in the policy domain, having graduated with a master's degree in strategic studies from the Naval War College. And he's also been a senior fellow in New York at the Council of Foreign Relations, Major General McPhillips. Thank you, Doctor. 
Well, uh, thank you, Susie, and the East West Center team for uh, having me today. I'm a little bit nervous following an undersecretary and a Nobel laureate, so uh, please bear with me. Um, I also appreciate the group that's here today um, because your role in the Indo Pacific, and particularly the information space, is uh, critical. Uh, and I certainly look forward to candid discussions as we uh, continue the dialogue today. I believe the current security environment um, is pretty dangerous. If you look at the Russian aggression in Ukraine, it provides a stark reminder that war remains violent and unpredictable. Additionally, we are witnessing the largest and fastest military buildup from the PRC since World War II and they continue to upend rules and norms, not only in the Indo-Pacific, but around the world. The DPRK continues to launch missiles that destabilize the region. Since the end of World War II, the United States and our allies and partners in the Pacific have worked together to build and strengthen the rules-based international order that makes all countries in the Indo-Pacific prosperous, including the PRC. Undoubtedly, U.S. national security and our prosperity, as well as the future of the global economic order, are intricately tied to the Indo-Pacific region. We are committed to the region in preserving a free and open Indo-Pacific so that all nations, big and small, have an equal voice and a chance uh, to meet their uh, goals. The United States has always been an Indo-Pacific nation. We just happen to live on the east side, dating back to the 1700s, and we continue to deepen our people-people ties, our economic linkages, and defense relationships across the region. To strengthen these relationships, we hold over 100 exercises a year with our allies and partners, and even greater number of exchanges and engagements to strengthen our interoperability. While there's no doubt that we are in an area of uh, increased strategic competition, the trajectory of the region will be uh, determined by our collective actions. Indo-PACOM's mandate is to prevent regional conflict. We are here to deter conflict and preserve the free and open Indo-Pacific. This includes synchronizing uh, military actions across the domains and to ensure military efforts complement and support diplomatic and economic initiatives, all synchronized with our allies and partners. This is aligned to Secretary Austin's integrated deterrence vision, which means using all capabilities across for the military across the domains of air, land, sea, space, and cyber with diplomatic, informational, and other military and economic uh, levers of international power. Importantly, we'll use the capability and capacity of our allies and partners while conducting integrated deterrence. The last piece is key since deterrence only succeeds if many countries are invested in preventing conflict and securing an open, a free and open Indo-Pacific. Our security alliances and partnerships in the Indo-Pacific are a profound source of stability. So integrated deterrence in the region will continue to center on our ties with our proud treaty allies, Australia, Japan, Philippines, South Korea, and Thailand, and remain unwavering in our mutual defense commitments. We also cherish our relationships with friends and partner nations and will strive to ensure their interests are protected. Additionally, we are working closer with our allies and partners to seek ways to expand minilateral and multilateral cooperation in the region and around the world, diplomatically, economically, and in the defense spheres. We are committed to ASEAN and the PIF and see organizations like this as critical to the strength of the Indo-Pacific. And from a defense perspective, we're pursuing more expanded multilateral exercises and cooperation, enhanced information sharing, um, networks, fusion centers, maritime domain awareness, cyber and space coordination, uh, all to address emerging challenges and to protect the global commons, which make us all so prosperous. 
We also aim to seek out decisively and collectively against uh, violations of international law and norms. Although the Indo-Pacific region is blanketed by water and spans half the globe, it is the wealthiest, most populated, and distributed place on Earth. As President Biden stated in the Quad Leaders Summit last year, the future of each of our nations, and indeed the world, depends on a free and open Indo-Pacific, enduring and flourishing in the decades to come. In a quickly changing strategic landscape, we recognize that the interest of America and our allies and partners can only be advanced if the United States maintains our commitment in the Indo-Pacific and strengthens the region itself alongside our closest allies and partners. Undoubtedly, our competitive advantage in the region is our unmatched and unrivaled network of allies and partners. We continue to work closely with our allies and partners to maintain a free and open Indo-Pacific, ultimately to deliver integrated deterrence. This conference is an incredibly valuable event for the Indo-Pacific region because free and independent press with journalists like you all is absolutely critical to all of our efforts. Your perspectives help further our understanding and shape our collective approach to promoting a peaceful and secure region. I appreciate and thank you for your attendance today and for what you do every day. Everything we do at Indopaycom is to prevent conflict, support our allies and partners, and to ensure that all nations in Indopaycom, big or small, have the opportunity to benefit from a free and open Indo-Pacific. It's been my honor and privilege to speak to you here for a minute, and I look forward to answering any of your questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, General McPhillips. That was a terrific uh, um, contribution to Undersecretary Allen's comments on the media and the diplomacy landscape. So great to have your um, um, comments on the defense side and the security role of the United States in the region. So I invite questions. I understand there are some questions coming from online as well, and I will be notified. But first, let me start. If I see clearly, is it Bill Armbruster? Yes, it is. It is yes. Bill Armbruster. Okay. Bill Armbruster, please, your question to the general. Yes, uh, General, I'm a retired journalist and East West Center alum. Uh, my question for you is this. I certainly understand the sensitivities about the U.S. relationship with Taiwan, but uh, what, what can the U.S. do to help Taiwan uh, uh, ensure its uh, freedom and independence? Thanks for your question. I would say that um, from the military perspective, we are doing everything we can to ensure that um, Taiwan has what it needs to defend itself. We continue to highlight um, activities in the region that promote instability, right, and that would that would cause anything other than a, a peaceful transition, um, we continue to work to prevent. Thanks. Thank you, General. Let's go to this side. Yes, sir, please, a short question, and then uh, we can move to the General. I'm Arvinda Brara, and as you can probably guess, I'm from India originally. Um, my question is uh, that uh, there is a strategic alliance between the US, Japan, Australia and India, uh, is that effectively working? Is that uh, uh, real and is that going to be effective in the future? The Quad. You're talking about the Quad? Yeah. At, no, it's, it's a, an incredibly valuable venue for um, some of the nations with the most influence and presence in the region to cooperate. And I talked about multilateralism and minilateralism. Um, at my level, I work with my Indian counterparts, Japanese counterparts, and Australian counterparts to increase the amount of um, capacity and reach, for example, we have in humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. And all of those things filter up to the, to the highest level where the Quad Summit is. Those are incredibly valuable for us to um, uh, show the rest of the world that there is alignment in the Pacific about maintaining a free and open Indo-Pacific. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move to this side, sir, please. Hi, uh, this is uh, Sam from um, Federated States of Micronesia. 
I uh, just want to thank you for uh, providing uh, security and st uh, stability in our uh, part of uh, the Pacific. Uh, I'm, my question is uh, regarding uh, community relations. Uh, we've, uh, uh, from what I've seen, uh, there, there are some lessons to be learned from the military uh, uh, bases in uh, Okinawa, in Guam, and even uh, maybe even here on, uh, on, in Hawaii. I want to ask, uh, because now there's, I see some developments in, uh, in my country of FSM. How, how can we make the relationship between the military and the local population better in FSM, having learned some experiences from Okinawa and from Guam? Yeah. Oh, the relationship between the military and the civilian? The civilian population. Yes. Yeah, it's something that um, we take a, a great, as a Marine, having lived in Okinawa and responded to disaster events across the region, it's something that we at Indo-PACOM take as one of our very most basic um, but imp foundational approaches to the way we engage certainly um, uh, the Pacific Island countries. We try to um, modulate the size and type of forces that we send to an individual country so we are sensitive to the local population and what they need and what they might want. And if we do an exercise there, we typically plan ahead to bring um, things there that develop goodwill for the government, things that the government can do while we're there for their local populace, right? Such as, you know, vaccines or masks or those kind of things. So we um, pay very close attention to the relationships we have in the region and we are very conscious all the time of U.S. big military bringing too much and, and you know, all, my word, steamrolling some of the smaller countries. So wh while I'm sitting in Indo-PACOM, we try very hard to um, match what we bring in capability and people to what the nation needs there. Um, thank you very much, uh, General McPhillips. Great to have you and great to have a view from Indo-PACOM on our defense role in the region. Thank you so much. Thank Please you. join me in thanking General McPhillips. As his moderator, I've called on myself to do the next presentation, uh, which is on your program, and it's titled, Asia Matters for America, How and How Much? Facts, Polls, and Perspectives. And really, um, this follows well on Under Secretary Allen's and General McPhillips' um, comments this morning on uh, diplomacy and defense and uh, our president's comments on this major initiative of the East-West Center. Uh, and I'd like to explain a little bit about it to you and to tell you why it's important and some of the issues and programming that derive from it as we turn increasingly as a country and as a region to U.S. Indo-Pacific relations. Um, the first thing to note is that the Indo-Pacific strategy of the Biden administration has two references to something that has not been in previous strategies which is a reference to everyday Americans. And the specific quote is that the strategy asserts that the prosperity of everyday Americans is linked to the Indo-Pacific. And the second reference to everyday Americans, and it goes even further, saying that the strategy concludes that, quote, our considerable strategic ambitions derive from the belief that no region will be of more importance and consequence to the world and to everyday Americans than the Indo-Pacific. These are pretty bold statements to put into a strategy and directly link it to domestic politics and domestic prosperity. So the problem is they're not very easy to monitor or to measure or to track and to use in concrete ways for an institution like the East-West Center to inform our education exchange leadership and professional development mission. So what do we mean between everyday Americans and elites? And I wanna talk a little bit about it. The overall initiative has a number of elements. You see the publications before you. There's also a website uh, where we regularly post articles of relationships between the United States and Asia at the national, state, and local level. All our publications are broken down by state and congressional district, including the most recent Pacific Island Matters for America that our president launched before the United States Congress a couple of months ago. And it also involves a whole bunch of activities 
that we do in Washington, around the United States, and in the region, including with the State Department. For instance, uh, two or three East Asia Strategy Summits ago, we launched um, uh, the Asia Matters version in Singapore on the sidelines of the East Asia Summit. So thank you to, uh, to the State Department for their support of that effort. Now, let me just summarize findings. You can read the reports at your leisure, but I want to summarize six or seven findings for the purpose of showing you the difficulty of monitoring and measuring the impact on everyday Americans and the difference between facts and polling and what they suggest about the challenges ahead and the kinds of engagement we need to do. First, let's take General McPhillip's comment about the importance of the Indo-Pacific to America's defense and strategic role, including the high demand side for the United States in the region. The region has more, almost, um, has more troops than any other region, almost give or take 90,000 on active duty in the region. But when we polled elites, when we say elites, by the way, we were talking about state and local officials, bureaucrats in state and local governments, and business leaders, and then contrasted that with a separate poll, but related poll on the same questions with the general public. Let me tell you the dichotomy. Here we have this huge presence um, based on demand signals from the region for these alliances, for these partnerships. And 30% of the elites we uh, polled think the U.S. should increase troops in the region. But only 18% of the general public that we surveyed believes, uh, agrees with that statement. So there's clearly um, a, a dissonance between our own electorate in terms of, uh, of the relative role. Americans also feel, general public also feel less strongly than elites about diplomatic ties and protecting allies in the region. I don't read these things as negative at all. I see these as opportunities to further engage the American public and communities, stakeholders, and constituencies. Almost 50% of Americans say that what happens in Asia matters to their state. On the other hand, elites think, almost 70% of elites think what happens in Asia matters to their states. Here again, we can do more, I think, to engage the American public in understanding significance of the region. Trade is a big issue in the United States and in the region, major trading countries, major areas of trade. 60% of maritime trade goes through the Indo-Pacific, as you know, and the general referred to how important it is to protect the global commons. 30% of US goods and services exports go uh, to the Indo-Pacific. But when we did the polling survey, which the report is in front of you, only 18% of Americans believe that Asian economies matter a lot to their states, while 43% of elites think so. And only 25% of everyday Americans find trade with China and other countries in Asia extremely or very beneficial to their state, while almost 50% of elites think so. So here again, we're playing with the facts and with the opinion polling and the divergences, and it also differs by region and by state. So when you look at the report, we have heat maps of every state and how dependent they are on trade with the Indo-Pacific regions. There is one area where elites and the general public are particularly closely aligned, however, roughly 70% to 78% of everyday Americans and elites both fear and, and have concern about losing trade competitiveness to China, which has been a big issue in our discussions in the policy domain and domestic politics. On foreign direct investment, and this is an extraordinary figure, to be honest, it surprised me when we did the data analysis. In 2019, foreign direct investment from the Indo-Pacific region into the United States for the first time in history surpassed American foreign direct investment into the region. So we are relying on countries such as Australia, Japan, Korea, and others, many others, to invest in the United States, build factories, make jobs, et cetera. So this is almost 60% of elites believe that such investment has been at least somewhat beneficial, and 55% believe that even investment from China, it can be beneficial to our economy here in the United States. However, this view is not shared reciprocally in the general public. On jobs, major issue in any political democratic electorate, Almost four million United States jobs are supported by exports to and investment from the Indo-Pacific. 
and greenfield investment, the kind of investment I just talked about, almost 685,000 jobs have been created in the U.S. since 2003. However, here again, some cautions. The general public that we polled through the Chicago Council, um, uh, through the University of Chicago, does not regard benefits of trade to be especially useful to job creation in the states. And nearly 60% were unsure whether trade and investment with Asia was beneficial to their state. And only 10% of everyday Americans believe that trade with China and the rest of Asia are sources for job creation, while 50% of state and local elected officials, state bureaucrats, and business leaders thought so. The same is true for tourism. It's hard to describe how important tourism, and because of the COVID pandemic, we have seen some of this uh, very much in play in real life and in real numbers. In 2019, over 50 million Indo-Pacific visitors came to the United States, spending almost $93 billion in services and expenditures across the U.S. That's a 68% increase since 2011. But over 30% of Americans that we polled are unsure about the impacts of tourism from Asia on their state economies. And nearly 20% of Americans think tourism from Asia is not at all or only a little beneficial to their economies uh, and their state. I know we're coming up on time, so I'll simply say that similar dissonances or gaps between the facts, the data, the analytics, and elite and public opinion polling shows up on other areas, such as educational exchange, the heart of the East-West Center's mission, and immigration and population. So what should we mean? What does this mean? It means that there is a significant amount of work to do in the policy space, in the public diplomacy space, and in the educational exchange um, and research space to engage Americans, both at elite levels and everyday Americans, with our Indo-Pacific counterparts to explain why this vital relationship is the future and is important to both sides and why they have a stake in it. I am particularly worried about the gap that we find between elite views and between general public. And if you'll read the report carefully, we find particular gaps in understanding and appreciation of the U.S. Indo-Pacific relationship in various states and regions of our country and between political parties. So this has also domestic implications. The bottom line for me is that from the perspective of U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis the Indo-Pacific and for an institution such as the East-West Center committed to building better relations between the peoples and governments of the United States and the region, there is a considerable space for us to advance our cooperative education and exchange mission. In this vein, I'm absolutely delighted to use this occasion of the International Media Conference and the Alumni Conference to, um, uh, to announce two major initiatives that we'll be doing. The first is to seek to expand our programs on Asia across the United States to bring the importance of the U.S.-Asia relationship to states and localities, to state legislatures, to mayor's offices, to civic society groups, to uh, NGOs, and to the public. In particular, we are looking to begin a program of uh, online curriculum, seminars, and um, exchanges for state and local officials through their representative bodies. Uh, we already, this, as, uh, related to this, is Spencer Gross and his team will be publishing new state reports on Texas, Washington State, and Hawaii. And we're working with those government officials in those states and experts from their universities and business groups to develop reports that highlight how their state is vested and has equities uh, in the U.S. Indo-Pacific relationship. And a second major effort that we will launch is to begin a program to encourage rising journalists, both in the United States and in the region, to contribute stories on local impacts, debates, and issues surrounding U.S. Indo-Pacific relations. And we hope to use these stories to highlight the ways in which we don't necessarily see at the national level these exchanges, but how they continue to inform and expand uh, the U.S. Indo-Pacific relationship. So we look forward to working with our journalist colleagues in um, 
in Honolulu, uh, Susan Kreifels and her team, and we've been working together for many years. So that, in a nutshell, is the Asia Matters for America initiative. Um, I would note that apart from these two reports that we've provided and released for the first time today, there are reports on Japan, ASEAN, Australia, India, Pacific Islands, and we will soon be releasing, and I have to recognize Assistant Secretary, former Assistant Secretary of State um, uh, for East Asia and Pacific, Dave Stilwell, who's been an enormous uh, counselor and guide as we get ready to release the Taiwan Matters for America, America Matters for Taiwan report to the U.S. Congress uh, later in July. So thank you very much. And with that, I'm absolutely delighted to move to the next segment of our program, which is senior journalists from the region commenting on the role of the United States Indo-Pacific relationship. May I invite them, please, to come up to the podium? We have um, online Robert Delaney, North American Bureau Chief for the South China Morning Post. There he is. Uh, Robert, thanks so much for joining us virtually. Great to have you. You saw, heard from Nirmal Ghosh this morning, but delighted again to have him, and he's a great friend to have in Washington. Um, Anne Shea from uh, Taiwan, uh, Taipei, Jengmin yeah. Lee, welcome from the uh, Korean Broadcasting System. Uh, Mr. Shahid uh, from The Diplomat, based in Lahore. Uh, Ms. Sherwani from The Wire, and um, let's kick it off. So first things, you've heard from Under Secretary Allen, you heard from General McPhillips. You heard a little bit from me about the state of U.S. Indo-Pacific relations. Welcome your views. Why don't we just go from this end, this, and give me two, three minutes on sort of some issues that animate your thinking about this relationship. Thank you very much for this opportunity, uh, especially you were the last one, so I heard your lecture as well and the report um, and the difference between the elite view and the view of the public. I think I'm here to represent the view of the public. Um, what does the public think about foreign policy issues? So it is going to be more of an outsider's view into foreign policy. Um, I um, appreciate the fact that US is still is the leader of the free world. But I think in the past few years, what we are realizing is that there is a grave doubt about its stability and reliability. And why I say so, there is a reason for me to say so. I feel uh, specifically if I talk about in terms of India, I appreciate the comments made by um, Under Secretary Liz Allen, and I appreciate the sensitivity uh, that the, the United States is showing. Um, also, the words of encouragement that they, they do know what's happening in India, but still, I would want to expand it, as I said, that I represent the views of the public, uh, which is that um, what we saw from, um, you know, Secretary of State Blinken, um, and the reports issued by them that um, they are concerned about what is happening in the, in, and around the region, but at the same time, this is more of a business as usual approach. Uh, what is happening in India right now is we are at a breaking point. What we are witnessing is almost an existential threat to India's democracy. India's democracy as a liberal, multicultural, uh, diverse, and secular democracy. To give you an example of what's happening right now is within the last three days, there have been two people, mm. one a human rights activist and another uh, a fact checker, they both have been jailed. And to give you more examples of how India in 2021, it became the, you know, a country with more than 100 internet shutdowns, which is the highest shutdowns in the world. Um, and then, um, India's freedom of uh, speech, freedom of press, it is under serious attack. And I do feel that there is an almost an SOS situation for India's democracy and free speech. Me, as a political journalist reporting on Narendra Modi's government, it is at such a critical point that whatever I say here, I am not sure whether it will have consequences or not. Whether I will be able to go back to my country if I'll be stopped at the airport, or there will be police people waiting for me. So what I'm trying to say here is that I do understand India as a very important ally for US. I understand this common front, a united front against a very assertive China in the region. Uh, India as an investment destination for US, a big market. But what the need of the hour right now is to also make human rights, religious freedom, and press freedom as part of the strategic dialogue. This is what I want to say. This is what I'm here for. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sharwani. Thank you very much indeed. 
Uh, Nirmal, over to you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Satu. And by the way, excellent reports. Um, uh, I was struck by one thing General McPhillips said right at the, at the top, which was that we live in increasingly dangerous times. Mm -hmm. And he referenced military expenditure. I, was, I just pulled up the, the, the most recent uh, Stockholm Inter International Peace Research Institute um, figures, which say that world military expenditure passed two trillion. Mm -hmm for the first time last year, yep. to 2021. And the five largest spenders, by the way, were the United States, China, India, the UK, and Russia, accounting for 62% of expenditure. And of course, the, what Ukraine has shown us is that war is always a possibility. And with this guy, and, and now because uh, of the new, um, uh, the implications for security in Europe, you, you're gonna see, you're gonna see weapons uh, expenditure go up in Europe as well. So I think this, this dangerous situation is actually going to get even more dangerous because we, we have a world awash with weapons. And uh, I think this basically uh, makes more imperative the need for engagement and diplomacy. Now, at the latest Shangri-La dialogue in, in, in Singapore, for example, just a month ago, we saw um, a little bit of sparring between the US and China over the issue of uh, Taiwan and so forth. But I chose to see a silver lining in which I mean, both, both sides said, yes, we need to keep talking. Mm. We need more engagement, more diplomacy. And I think in order to avoid um, thing, uh, another, another Ukraine, a clash, a kinetic clash somewhere by accident or design, I think it is absolutely critical that uh, engagement and diplomacy is enhanced even between competitors, uh, and, I'm, and I mean, of course, US and China. But again, going back to some things we discussed yesterday at, at this conference, also giving agency to middle powers, mm. smaller countries and middle powers. It is very important, and this, in fact, is somewhat reflected in your report on elites and general public. The gap between the gen general public and elites is, is concerning mm. in some respects. And I think we, one must carry the people because it's, it, in the end, it is the people we are talking about. We must carry the people with us and uh, avoid sort of sliding into a situation where we have a horror like Ukraine uh, repeated in some other part of the world. Thank you very much, Nirmal. That's terrific. Um, you brought up the U.S.-China relationship, but it uh, wasn't planned this way, but we turn over to Anne from Taipei. Hello, everyone. And uh, it's my great honor to be here. Thank you for uh, having me. Uh, first, I would like to uh, echo uh, acting under Secretary of State Liz, you mentioned about that uh, uh, urgent need and demand for cooperation uh, to fight disinformation. Taiwan has been uh, the country most uh, affected by disinformation for the past uh, nine years, according to the research of University of Gothenburg in Sweden. And uh, on, on the one hand, we suffer a lot because the big brother on the street of, on the other side of the street. And, uh, but on the other hand, uh, there are many uh, fact-checking apps and uh, NGO uh, button up from the civil society. I think uh, Taiwan can uh, contribute or share the experience in fighting this information. And the second, I want to echo uh, Dr. Satu, you, you mentioned uh, the, the big uh, initiate Asia matters for America. I want to share that uh, Taiwan also matters for America uh, because Taiwan is the uh, economic powerhouse of advanced uh, computer chips. Uh, during the pandemic, everybody knows that there is huge disruption on the uh, supply chain of advanced computer chips. And uh, uh, I think it is very important for Taiwan to join the uh, regional uh, trade pack of such as uh, Indo-Pacific uh, economic framework. And unfortunately, uh, Taiwan was excluded uh, from that uh, e economic trend framework. Uh, I think if Taiwan can join uh, Indo-Pacific economic framework, Taiwan can contribute and that is helpful for the sustain sustainability of the supply chain of advanced computer chips. Thank you. 
Thank you, Anne. And as I mentioned again, and I sent you a photo of the Taiwan president holding up Taiwan Matters for America at a launch of the American Chamber of Commerce in Taipei. So we're delighted, and we're going to launch it here in the Congress in mid-July. And so great to, to ha have your support for that, to show Taiwan's importance well beyond just the uh, military or defense issues. We turn now to uh, Mr. Shahid from The Diplomat in Lahore. Please, sir. Hi. Um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, two things struck me from uh, this morning's conversation. Uh, the first thing uh, was uh, Madam Secretary Elizabeth Allen's uh, keynote speech, which I, it was an absolute pleasure to um, listen to it in person over here. But the thing that struck me the most was your uh, echoing of uh, the dedication towards strengthening democratic institutions uh, around the world through funding and other means. <clears throat> and I come from Pakistan, and despite dozens and tens of billions of dollars being invested in Pakistan over the past seven decades. Uh, those institutions, whether that's open internet, uh, freedom of uh, journalism, human rights, uh, and those institutions are non-existent, unfortunately. Mm. Uh, of course, much of that is owing to the lack of commitment showed by <coughs> Pakistan's rulers, the military establishment. But I do tend to question whether there is a genuine um, commitment in the West as well to strengthening those institutions. Uh, the second thing that struck me was, <clears throat> and there was a question about Pakistan uh, earlier this morning, uh, not surprisingly in connection to a conspiracy theory because we tend to enjoy those uh, in our neck of the woods. But we sometimes do too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's, it's a global phenomenon now. But what was interesting is how quickly the conversation steered towards India from Pakistan. And no one enjoys hyphenating Pakistan with India more than Pakistan itself. And we also enjoy hyphenating Pakistan with Afghanistan, uh, which is also how the world hyphenates Pakistan uh, as well. And the Duran line itself is more, more, less a border and more, more an hyphenation between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, why that is, and I think it's important to understand uh, Pakistan's hyphenation with Afghanistan in the context of how the West has seen Pakistan from its inception. Uh, <clears throat> Pakistan's creation uh, was facilitated by the Western powers um, in, in <clears throat> because the, the leaders leading the movement for Pakistan were aligned towards the West. And they, there were apprehensions in the West that uh, there will be Soviet expansionism southwards towards India and Afghanistan, which is the very uh, foundation of the so-called uh, Great Game. <clears throat> but uh, if I may say so, the the leaders of uh, <coughs> the founding fathers of Pakistan understood uh, the assignment as the meme goes uh, very well. And from the very inception, they've not only tried to link themselves with Afghanistan, they've also realized that since the movement itself was an Islamic separatist movement, uh, they have tended to focus toward not just Islamizing uh, Pakistan itself, but uh, the entire region, whether that's Islamizing Afghanistan, whether it's Kashmir, or uh, <clears throat> um, uh, Bangladesh, formerly East Pakistan, uh, which is now doing much better than Pakistan, at least on the Human Development Index and um, other economic indicators. So <clears throat> um, my uh, issue over here is that Pakistan needs to be viewed uh, from the focus on Pakistan itself and not in the regional context. And I think, again, I would repeat that the, the guilty party here are the Pakistani rulers. Uh, because they have never, there hasn't been a single moment in the history of Pakistan where the interests of the Pakistani people has taken precedence over everything else, whether it's in the eyes of the Pakistani rulers or the eyes of the West. Well, thank you, Mr. Shaheed. Thanks very much for those comments, and I'm sure we'll come back to some of them. Let me turn to our colleague from Korea, from KBS, Jung Min Lee. Please. Thanks for having me here, and this is the first time for me to participate here, so I'm very honored to be here. So, uh, what I want to talk about is actually, I, we all know that Asia matters for America and America matters for Asia. And actually, the US uh, did a lot of good things to Asia. And uh, just what I want to US to do more is that sometimes, like, when I define Asia, like, like Asia is just a huge region, right? So Asia consists of a lot of countries and each country have a kind of different background and different uh, history and different situations 
of course. And sometimes I feel when uh, the U.S. made up kind of the foreign policy toward Asia, sometimes the U.S. just see the Asia just one region, not uh, uh, just not ignoring each country's situation, but not really focused on their own situation. So, for example, uh, in South Korea, uh, several years ago. South Korea and Japan made a kind of a big agreement to just remove the uh, historical conflict, mm. and the U.S. forced it a lot. And then, uh, several year, uh, after several years, the agreement was broke up because it didn't really gain a lot of po the, the agreement didn't really get a lot of popularity from South Korean people, mm. and. It was quite a shame because uh, the U.S. really wanted to make that agreement to uh, make both Korea and Japan to be cooperated. So it's a little bit shame, and I think like the reason why uh, the agreement was failed is actually the U.S. Even though the U.S. really supported the agreement, U.S. didn't really think about how deep the historical conflict is. And I, I also think U.S. should have made uh, the, some kind of mediation between two countries. And also, when we confront China, it's a big actually it's a big issue in South Korea. And South Korea has a very weak. Uh, South Korea is a really strong ally of the U.S., but South Korea also has a very strong economic relationship with China. Like 40% of our export uh, rely on China. So it's just, just huge. And when we decide of our policy toward China, it is very hard to just split our position from China. So, and, and the U, what the U.S. asked for is to go with China together, but it is quite hard it's quite a harsh decision for uh, South Korean government. Uh, in so. conclusion, uh, what I want to uh, say is actually we have our own situation and America should understand it more. Mm. And we want to, uh, to like just, we want to watch like the vision, what the U.S. asked for. So I just think it's very, important one and the US when the US showed their uh, policy toward China and toward North Korea even toward other countries uh, so just I want US uh, ask what uh, they could do for us it, it would be very helpful thank you Thank you, Jungmin. I, I think that's one of the hardest homework assignments you've given to our officials, is for the U.S. to do better on the Korea-Japan relationship and the Korea-China relationship. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have not forgotten at all our good colleague, uh, Robert Delaney, North American Bureau Chief, um, online. I turn to you, sir, and I'm going to give you one other small assignment, Robert, is at the end of your comments, if you could tack on 30 seconds on what your perception of our president's announcement, President Biden's announcement, about the plus up of US military forces to Ukraine, simultaneously with the fact that our key allies, Australia, Japan, Korea, and others are attending the NATO summit, and how you see this Europe-Asia nexus as we're uh, in the current environment. So over to you, Robert. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. LeMay, uh, and thanks everyone for inviting me to the forum. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but yes, let me, um, Satu, let me start with the question that you, uh, that you asked me about uh, President Biden's announcement uh, about military, uh, uh, the plus up of military uh, aid uh, to, uh, to Ukraine. Uh, I would say that, uh, that Biden is doing his utmost to, uh, to, revive uh, to, to restore the foundation of the post-World War II order, which was very much focused on uh, obviously Europe. Uh, and while at the same time, he's doing everything he possibly can to foster the idea of this, uh, this, this sort of 
cross uh, Atlantic and Pacific um, uh, um, alliance. Uh, and I think we saw that in the way that, uh, for example, at the NATO meeting earlier this week, we had participation from Japan and South Korea, uh, and, and particularly with South Korea. Uh, as, as Jungmin was just explaining, uh, I, I think that's actually quite a significant move, uh, given the difficult situation that South Korea finds itself in. Uh, so uh, I would say that the Biden administration is, uh, is, 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 is making more progress than I would have expected them to, be, to do. In, in, in sort of reviving that spirit of uh, the, uh, the, 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 the NATO alliance, the US and Europe, and also at the same time, uh, really revamping that by, uh, by pulling over the top of it, this sort of more uh, expansive layer, this layer that really goes stretches all the way over to Asia throughout the whole Asia Pacific region. Um, I, you know, I find these Developments to be incredibly compelling and important. Um, so, uh, so if that if that addresses your question, I hope. Uh, and then I guess I would it just does, say, thanks. Sure. Um, so I, I'm sorry there was a bit of last minute logistics in setting me up via Zoom. So I didn't get the opportunity to listen to under under secretary uh, under secretary Allen. Uh, I, I think I would just say I, I would just make a very short observation about uh, whether or not America matters to Asia, and I would say. I, it was a couple of months ago that there was a discussion at Brookings where uh, it was featuring uh, 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 Mr. Uh, uh, Ka uh, Ka Karotono. He was the former uh, Japanese defense minister and currently a lawmaker. Uh, he, he was very direct with his comments about the Indo Pacific, uh, Biden's Indo Pacific economic framework, in that he basically boiled down, he said, forget IPEF and just rejoin uh, CPT, or join CPTPP. And so uh, I, you know, I, I think that really demonstrated the frustration with which a lot of Asian countries uh, felt in, in the way that the US pulled out of TPP. Uh, and I, 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 think we, I think many of us were gearing up to see a very little response at all to in, in, in terms of uptake for IPEF but uh, in the end, the Biden administration managed to pull off bringing 12 uh, countries together. And so I, I, you know, I, I would just say, I would just want to use that, those developments to, uh, to, to, to suggest that uh, despite misgivings that a lot of countries in Asia have with the US government for being, uh, certainly being very transactional, uh, in in some cases, uh, fair uh, sometimes fair weather. Uh, I th I think that at the end of the day, they understand the importance uh, of uh, the U.S. Uh, presence and U.S. influence in the Indo-Pacific. Um, and uh, and and I think I'll just leave it there. Uh, thanks so much, Robert. And again, I invite people to begin to come up to the uh, microphones on either side to get questions. Okay, I see some questions. We have our colleague from India, Mr. Bara, if I recall correctly from earlier. You, sir, again, please. Yeah, I'm Ari Bara from India. I, my question is to Mr. Shahid. Can the journalists of Pakistan start a movement to build on love and friendship between the two countries rather than uh, let the military junta dominate and, you know, for, it's in their interest to... Thanks have more and more arms. Thanks, Mr. Barra. Mr. Shahid, please. Uh, thank you for that question. It's interesting you asked that because I'm also here as part of a cross-border program. So I have to balance my role as a peacenik with my role as a journalist as well. To answer your question more uh, blatantly and maybe provocatively as well, uh, peace movements unfortunately do not hike up defense budgets. Uh, that's, that's the core issue. And even in, in an economic crisis in Pakistan, uh, the military, for example, has seen an increase in defense budget where there is rap, you know, rapid inflation. Um, so people to people contact are important, but when the narratives are so divisive, you've, you've seen that, that in India as well. But I'd like to focus on my own country. The moment you started arguing as not just as a fringe, uh, fringe opinion, but the moment you said that 
the Muslims and Hindus of the subcontinent are two different nations. That was the moment where the division began. And unfortunately, that narrative is still there in Pakistan. It is being taught through school curricula. It, it is still um, being uh, propagated by the state, by uh, including uh, my colleagues in the media. Um, the equation of Pakistan with Islam and India with Hinduism is mainstream in Pakistan. It will take a lot of effort for all of us to challenge that and fix that. Uh, it's not easy, but we can obviously we can work towards that. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Mr. Shahid. And and it's great that the East West Center has this cross border journalism program between India and, and Pakistani journalists, among other programs. So thank you so much for participating in that. Um, can we go to our board member? I believe I see Mr. Gene Ward, who's a member of the state legislature and a, a board of governor uh, here at the East West Center. Gene? My question is this a lot of you express some really extremely important insights into what are better relations, what are some of the problems in the relationships. The question is, and as a member of the board, how can the East West Center do better? How can we help? How can we facilitate more in doing what each of you have suggested? Open-ended question. Can we About start? The East West Center. Thanks so much, Gene. That's terrific. You're, you're giving them some homework assignment that helps us. Ms. Sherwani. Thank you very much. I think um, what East West Center should be doing, a large part of it they already are doing, the very fact that we all of us are sitting here, it's almost impossible to meet my Pakistani counterparts um, who is here and a few others. But what more East West Center can do is that I feel um, this is a world of ideas and we, uh, East West Center and journalists both, uh, we deal in the world of ideas. Right now what's happening in India is that there is uh, you know, they're preparing a sort of a, a, a prison for people who are, who can think and who are thought leaders. What we can build uh, through East West Center is that we, we, we should try and build solidarities and tell people in India specifically, I can only talk about India, that human rights defenders, journalists, social activists, lawyers and judges who are resisting this whole ideological transformation of the country, they should feel that they are not alone. I can say in my individual capacity that I do feel sometimes that people have my back, but most of the times I am lonely. It's a lonely fight. You feel there is a personal cost to what you're doing. I mean, what I do is a public work, but what I will, I will suffer is, is a personal cost. Mm. So I do feel that we should be people who are the frontline democracy defenders. They should feel supported. They should feel that there is someone who is listening to you, listening to them. And also the government, respective governments, in my case, the government of India should know that we have friends and we have supporters. Thank you. Thank you. Nirma, please, of course. Anyone, please. Anyone is welcome. Bob, Robert, also online, please. Yeah, just, just a very brief, very briefly, I think East West Center to just keep on keeping on, basically. And uh, I think uh, there's a very disturbing tendency in the world now to, re to regress into you know, narrow nationalism ethnic nationalism, that, that kind of thing. And with the superpower rivalry as well, it's, it's, as I said before, it's very dangerous. Uh, there are so many different points of view. Now, for example, sitting in Washington, D.C., D.C. is a bubble. Um, in, any, in any big country, the capital city, um, again, you know, with the um, foreign policy elite and security elite and so, forth, and so forth, it becomes a bubble. We have to break out of these bubbles. And I think the East West Center should do what what you've been doing, which is, you know, take Americans to China, take Americans to Southeast Asia, bring them across to the U.S., and so on and so forth. This sort of uh, interchange uh, of, of people, interchange of views, uh, breaks through the prism, the lens with mm. which, um, through which uh, big powers tend to see the world, right? Um, and uh, just, just quickly, one uh, last point. Um, uh, if you look at Asia, and this is something which came up yesterday briefly in one of the panels, I think, Asia is a very pluralistic place. Hmm. And it, Asia does not tend to, at least Southeast Asia for one, does not tend to see the world as a competition between democracies and autocracies and so forth. There are many different ways of seeing uh, uh, geopolitic, uh, geopolitical rivalries. And I think East West Center, if you break out of the bubbles, break out of the box, I think that would be a tremendous service to a world which is now increasingly fraught. Thank you, Nirmal. Anne, please. Hi. Um, I think for, for some reason, Taiwan always been uh, ex excluded from many in important 
international organization. Uh, I will be very happy to see that if EWC uh, was a center can hold an uh, international media conference in the future in Taipei. Yeah. Thank Excellent. you. Great idea, Susan. Thank you for the invitation. That sounds lovely. Mr. Shaheed, any comments on this before we move to Jungmin and Robert? Um, just that I'm ex extremely grateful to be given the opportunity to come here as part of the cross-border program. Something I said in an earlier session as well, that perhaps what we also need, especially from Pakistan, is cross-border programs with Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, with Iran, because we have, we tend to have issues with um, most of our neighborhoods. If, some, that's, if you can do something along those lines, that'd be great. Thank you. We'll talk to Susan about that as well. Please, Jungmin. Yeah. Uh, East Western Center already had a, I already put a lot of contribution to Asian countries and to deep uh, to deepen the interest and the understanding uh, between the U.S. and Asian countries. Uh, or what I want to suggest more is that uh, if there is another program of EWC uh, to deepen the understanding between Asian countries, so. Uh, frankly speaking, I know about South Korea, I know uh, somewhat about Japan and China, but frankly, I don't really know, uh, I, I don't have a deep understanding about Global South or even mm. Taiwan or other countries. So if there is a program that for us, <laughs> for me, to deepen the understanding to other Asian countries, it could be very good. Wonderful. I hope you'll you'll uh, confer with Susan about that. I know I don't know which fellowship you were on, but there's Jefferson Fellows sometimes <coughs> goes to Southeast Asia or other places, but there are other programs. So let's let's keep a dialogue going on that. Robert, can we turn to you? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I, I would just say one of the insights that I'm taking away from this conference that's for me has been very enlightening is the extent to which uh, the uh, many of the uh, uh, South Pacific island nations have had a very long-term relationship with the Chinese government in terms of um, journalists, uh, the journalist exchange programs, in terms of, uh, of, of, of government officials and, and bureaucrats. And uh, I, I think if to, to the extent to which East West Center is able to do that, I, I think it would be helpful to pull together as many of those details as possible and provide it to the State Department and say, uh, you know, and unfortunately, sometimes you have to speak it in, in their language and by saying that, hey, these are th these assets in uh, in the South Pacific. And, and it's, it's, you know, I, I wouldn't use that kind of language. But at the end of the day, there are unfortunately, I would say there are uh, there are many people in, in the State Department, who I think, see the world that way. And I, I think to show how much of a payoff there is mm. in terms of really funding uh, programs that are exchange programs that that are helpful, and 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 the, the the extent to which that can do a lot of the work that that the State Department is is trying to do now, where they're trying to counter the influence that China is exerting, uh, you know, and and perhaps by 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 genuinely coming up with programs that that would be helpful and appreciated uh, and doing more of them that way maybe the the government uh, the US government could wouldn't have to go so far in terms of funding in, in, in thinking in military terms in you know in funding bases and 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 weaponry and and whatnot so uh, that would be my suggestion thanks thanks very much Robert Gene I hope that was helpful to you for your question uh, let me go over to Bill Umbrister before coming back over to this side. Uh, yeah, I have a question for the Asian journalists here about the uh, Biden administration's proposed uh, Indo-Pacific economic framework. Uh, do you and do you think people in your countries uh, regard this as a serious initiative or is it maybe a public relations effort a after the Obama administration put so much effort into the Trans-Pacific Partnership only to see it from a U.S. perspective fall apart after uh, Trump pulled out his first week or two in office. Terrific question, Bill. Who wants to kick off on, um, on the views in the region, in your countries perhaps, of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework? Anne touched on this a little bit. 
Um, I think maybe Robert did too. Anyone else? Nirmal, I'm sure you've been watching this from a Washington perspective, but you know what's going on in Southeast Asia on this. Yeah, okay. Um, well, I, obviously I can't speak for any of the countries in Southeast Asia, uh, Singapore or anyone else, but um, this is, it is it's, ob it's definitely a welcome initiative, but it's still a little bit early, and I think there's still disappointment in, in the U.S. pulling out of the TPP. Um, and I've heard it said in Washington that the business of Asia is business. Um, trade, trade binds countries together. Trade increases our inter interdependence. So that's a very important principle. And so I think the IPEF is welcome. However, we, and, and it's, it was quite a pleasant, it was, it was a good thing that so many countries did mm. come on board. Mm. But uh, the proof of the pudding remains, will still be in the eating. And there is, there is still a cognizance of the fact that domestic opinion in the US public opinion is still wary of globalization and further trade ties and all that. And that is going to be a problem going forward. Mm. But yes, the, the, the region does want the US to put, more, put its money where its mouth is in, 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 you know, in, a, in a more meaningful manner. Thanks, Nirmal. Anyone else want to comment on this? How's it being seen in Korea, Jungmin? I mean, um, how about uh, Korean views on IPEF versus, because Korea is not in CPTPP, yes. though the new government in Korea has, I understand, been considering it. I think uh, several months ago, like uh, South Korea got a new administration, a new president, and so while the former president was quite uh, progressive, like the current president is quite conservative, and uh, like he is defined as a pro-America and like a little bit anti-China. <laughs> so, so I, I it was it was quite natural like for the current president to join the IPEF, and also uh, we anticipated it. it would be really helpful for our economy. And what we are worrying about is that, is uh, China's backlash, mm. because China always they already, already announced that like, China didn't want South Korea to be joined. Mm. So, so we already, uh, we've already experienced a lot of backlash from China when we do something against China, that even though we, we always deny that like, it's not anti-China. But China always uh, have a kind of suspicion to South Korean government. And it seems that like South Korea is always between Japan and China, like geopolitically and also geographically. Mm. So, so I think even though IPEF is uh, quite helpful for uh, our economy, it, I understand it was a very hard decision for South Korea and I hope it will, it will develop in a good way, mm. not in a bad way for South Korea. And can I just ask some kind of comment up about please. the comfort women issue? Of course, please. Yes, like, like I understand like uh, what is like the, the asker said. And uh, actually like there, is a, there are a lot of opinion about the comfort women issue agreement. And so what Korean people understand is uh, like the agreement made by both Korea and Japan government and actually Korean government didn't really want to uh, resist that agreement. So, and always we all know that the agreement is between two countries. Mm. So if one country don't really want to resist it, the agreement would naturally break up. Mm. So that's what I understand. I, I really, uh, agree. That I partly agree with his opinion, but it's, like, it's a, about the facts. So I want to, uh, some, I want to make some kind of correction. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. And maybe you guys can discuss later. This brings a lot of people together. So if you have an opportunity, you can discuss together. Anyone else on this question that Bill Armbruster posed about the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework? Oh, okay. Maybe we'll go then to the the question here. Please introduce yourself and. Yes, hi there. My name is May Lee, journalist from California. Um, my question actually is to Jung Min. Um, you know, Korea, as we know, uh, relies heavily on U.S. military presence. Um, and this is a sort of a generational question I want to ask you about the Korean people and how they feel. 
I have an 85-year-old mother who grew up in Korea, and so she's very grateful to how the U.S. came to save the country. Um, and we should all be grateful for that kind of sacrifice, of course, for our military forces. But then, of course, the younger generation in Korea, there have been a lot of protests in the past and to this day of U.S. military presence, wanting them to leave, um, wanting maybe re reunification with North Korea, and that's something that's constantly talked about as well. So from your perspective as a journalist, but also Korean um, of a different generation, how are Koreans feeling about this issue, and is there still a great divide on this particular issue? Oh, terrific question. Yeah. Jing Lin. Thanks for your question. Like, my generation, like, personally, I'm in my 40s. <laughs> and when I was very young, I uh, fully know that there, is a, there was a kind of anti-Americanism like, among university students. And it's, it's, I, I think like, the anti-Americanism is based on the relationship between, uh, relationship between South Korea and North Korea like some university students and, and many of our university students at the time believed that if there is no like U.S. trips in South Korea, like the relationship between South Korea and North Korea could be developed. And nowadays in 2022, I don't really think it's like the idea gets a popularity in South Korea. Like people, it's just, people just accept the US, uh, US troops presence in South Korea. Mm. And like several years ago when uh, South Korean president, uh, former South Korean president Moon Jae-in uh, made a kind of summit with North Korean leader. Uh, like he said, or like President Moon Jae-in said that uh, even North Korean leader Kim Jong-un Agreed, to, agreed, accepted the presence of U.S. troops in South Korea. So, like that means, I think in South Korea, like so people think U.S. presence is just U.S. presence in South Korea, and it is still helpful for our national security, and it has a function to defend our country against North Korea. So, I think like there is a kind of a slight change from the, the past idea about uh, U.S. troops. Thank you. Thank you, Jungman. Thanks, Mei Li, for your question. Look, we're coming very close to the end of our time. I see lunch boxes have been brought, and I want to give our journalists a last lightning round, 20, 30 seconds. Any final comments you'd like to make about this panel, U.S. Indo-Pacific relations, what you've heard today? and the themes that we've been discussing. So let me start with Robert. Uh, yeah, I guess I, I would just say maybe a final thought. Uh, I, I've really been struck by the, the degree to which journalists are now coming under attack in India. Uh, obviously, because of my focus, US-China relations, I, I, I don't, I'm not an expert uh, on India. So, uh, so here's the thing that really, that, that I find shocking about this, and especially about uh, the, the arrests um, that, that ARFA had uh, talked about, and I've heard about these before also uh, oh. <laughs> from, from other speakers. Um, I, I would just say that uh, in, in, in the way that the uh, Biden administration is really pulling together it, or is doing, uh, I think, uh, making more progress than, than many would have expected in pulling together an alliance that, that spans, basically spans the globe. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that, of course, this this alliance building is well of course it's against russia it's also against china and one of the criticisms that is always leveled by the us government against the chinese government is how uh, how tightly it controls the media and how there's there's really not much in the way of independent uh, media there uh, well that seems to be happening in in india also so uh, I, I think the biden administration needs to be very careful i think there's going to be a credibility problem if they're not looking closely at what's happening in India, uh, you know, and on the same note, of course, the uh, the administration is looking to engage more with Saudi Arabia, uh, despite the, the the responsibility of of that government for the death of um, uh, of Jamal uh, Khashoggi. So, uh, so yeah, that's it. That's my final thoughts. Uh, I I think uh, there's a lot of progress. Uh, but I think what's going on in India is very concerning, and I think the administration has to look at that very closely. 
Thank you, Robert, for making the case for the protection of journalists. Really uh, welcome that, and it's a perfect segue to, to yeah. Ms. Sharwani. Uh, I totally agree with what Robert is saying, and I, I think one of the realization in a post-COVID world, hopefully a post-COVID world, is that we are all in this together, and we cannot say that human rights abuse or press freedom for that matter, or religious freedom for that matter, they are any country's internal affairs. Mm. And the world certainly cannot afford the world's largest democracy falling into, descending into autocracy and, you know, such authoritarianism. Mm. I think if Indians were to lose, the world will lose. Um, so what I'm trying to say here is that we have to speak in one voice for human rights, for press freedom, for religious freedom, for a better, more peaceful, more united world. Thank you for that eloquent statement. So, Nirmal. Did you have something on it? Very quickly, and something which came up earlier in the conference as well, uh, you know, the question of uh, what you hear a lot from Asia, from Southeast Asia in particular, uh, and from Asia in general is, uh, you know, don't force us to choose between the US and China. This is a constant refrain from Southeast Asia. And um, I think what is important, and, and this goes back to some of your, your work, Satu, your amazing work on whether, how much the US matters in Asia and vice versa. The U.S. matters a great deal, obviously, but uh, uh, the U U.S. Uh, foreign direct investment, which is still greater than China's, hmm. notwithstanding the, the BRI, um, but also U.S. Um, military power. Um, and I think Southeast Asia and, and in South Asia also, they um, welcome U.S. engagement, but do not want to be placed in a position hmm. where they want, have to choose because some of them can't choose. Uh, several Asian countries have borders with China hmm. and they know how to live, they know what it is like to live with the rising China. Um, there are no illusions about China, there are no illusions either about the United States. But the United States is welcome as a balancer so that no one sort of small or middle sized country comes under the, the hegemony boom of one, of one major power. So as long as everybody's at the table, these countries, most of Asia is quite happy with a multipolar world, not a bipolar world where there is a chance of, uh, of them, you know, becoming pawns in another, mm. in, a, in a new sort of Cold War 2.0. Thank you for that, Nirmal, thanks. And? Hi, uh, I would like to share a wonderful book. Uh, the name is um, Ultimate Economic Conflict Between China and Democratic Countries. Uh, this book, uh, offer an institutional analysis between uh, China and democratic countries. Uh, most of businessmen uh, saw the struggle of two superpowers between the US and uh, China, and that, that just uh, the competition. But this book offer a deeper analysis that's about values, the values between democracy and autocracy. So if you want to see two superpowers fighting. That, that's more than that. So uh, that's about the uh, deep difference between values. So what should we do? Uh, the alignment between the democratic countries is very important. That's why. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Mr. Shaheed. Yeah. I'll continue on the same theme. The reason I alluded to the creation of Pakistan is that the country has now come full circle in the sense that you have an expansionist Russia waging war in Ukraine, and the day Vladimir Putin uh, invaded Ukraine February 24th, who was with him or in, in the same city that day? Imran Khan, the Prime Minister of Pakistan, or the former Prime Minister of Pakistan. That's where the conspiracy theory about him being ousted by the US comes into it. And here, I absolutely have to mention China, uh, because China with the China-Pakistan economic corridor, 62 billion worth, the highest ever investment from Beijing. It's a neoliberal, uh, colonial project that is linking Xinjiang with Balochistan, two hubs of human rights abuses. And my personal fear is that uh, the military establishment now wants a bidding war between the US and China. That bidding war will only strengthen the military itself, which in, in turn with you, uh, will use those resources to further uh, quash freedoms and liberties in Pakistan. Thank you, Mr. Shaheed. Zhang Min Li. Yeah, I'm, I'm just happy to be here because like we are talking about like the common Asian value and common Asian, uh, uh, common Asian value like about the democracy or uh, value-based law or something uh, something else. So I think it's very important to keep those common value like along 
all the other countries in Asia, even though like there is no participants here. Mm. And also, like we need a kind of effort to persuade each other to have the same value, like uh, the, under the same value of democracy and other values. It's, I think it's very hard because we are uh, living in the uh, realism area, so we always keep, uh, we always pursue our own national, uh, own national interests, and all the national interests are so different from each other. Mm. But I think sometimes, like not always, but sometimes the common value can keep us safe and ke uh, and keep us being together. So, like I think it's very important. Thank opportunity to thank be here. Thank you, Jungmin. Thanks so much. Well, you've heard an incredibly wide-ranging set of comments and discussions over a number of themes, but I took away three big ones that are relevant. Um, I'm sure you took away others. One, we must protect journalists, and journalists are critical to the sharing of information and news, and, and uh, which makes for better cit citizenry and better relations amongst people. I also heard a very strong, resounding view of the continued importance of US-Asia relations and the need to manage those carefully. And we heard that from our uh, wonderful officials this morning, Under Secretary Allen and, of course, uh, General McPhillips. And I'm very heartened to say that it kind of reinforces the view of the East-West Center's work on Asia Matters for America and America Matters for Asia, that this continuing relationship has to be worked on. It's not perfect. But there's a lot of space in the third, which our Board of Governor uh, Gene Ward brought up, which is what's the role of the East-West Center. And I'm very heartened to hear from all of you that the East-West Center has a very um, a continuing, very prominent and important role in forging the future direction of U.S. Indo-Pacific relations. So with that, please thank these wonderful journalists. Well, thank you again. Thank you. What a wonderful morning, hasn't it been? Thank you all so very much for your insights, and thank you our vi to our Vice President, Christina Monroe, our Alumni Director. Aloha, everyone. I wanted to give a special warm welcome to first-time International Media Conference attendees. You are now alumni. Welcome. <laughs> We will specifically be discussing in our board meeting this afternoon, bolstering our media programs chapter. Perhaps you saw, it's one of our flags. It's a, a program specific chapter, uh, obviously exciting people in that, but we're really looking to develop that and ask that you join, receive membership benefits of being part of the association and help us develop that chapter further. I'd like to as well recognize our virtual guests who are coming. Those from, uh, there's probably about this many people registered virtually, so we're doubling ourselves. Uh, so glad that you have been part of us, although we haven't seen you. And for the alumni conference virtual registrants, we'll start having some backstage interviews. You'll be getting an exciting um, experience of the conference with our co-hosts, Carlos and Panwin and uh, Amalina from, she's our uh, Malaysia-based co-host. Uh, aloha and welcome again to our alumni association. I'm joined here by my colleague Panwin. I'm Carlos Juarez uh, from the East-West Center, and we're just delighted to welcome all of you joining us today on Zoom. This has been an amazing experience. I'm sure many of you have enjoyed it. We saw this morning some very interesting uh, perspectives. Uh, Liz Allen, the uh, highest-ranking government official today, joined us, uh, acting Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs, and she offered some valuable insights in, uh, obviously, the administration's efforts to address a lot of the challenges in the region, and of course, the East West Center, we have long been a center for public diplomacy, so we do help uh, contribute to that. Uh, other than that, we've seen, again, a variety of perspectives continuing from the International Media Conference, uh, looking at a lot of the difficult challenges that journalists face today in the world. Uh, and, but more importantly, this is a gathering of East West Center alumni that brings so many of us together. We're excited to welcome people who haven't been together in years now, 
Uh, and Panwen, let me ask you, uh, give us some reflections of your takeaway from this first part of the morning session. Yeah, thank you, Carlos. And in case you missed the session this morning, my name is Panwen Yoking. I am a research fellow at the East West Center. And it has been delighted to be part of the watching the opening ceremony today. I really enjoy watching the Taiko performance. That was actually my first time watching the Taiko performance. And I really like the Hawaiian Ole and this morning. And also I thought the keynote speeches were really informative on spreading trust and fighting misinformation. I really enjoyed a session by Liz Allen, Nerman Gosh, as well as other prominent journalists that were part of the that were part of the panel. Uh, this has been an exciting chance to again reconnect for so many people, bring in as we always do, uh, different insights, different experts. Uh, but I think in the end of the day, it's it's about bringing together people and, and alumni who have uh, not come back for many years. So very excited to, to welcome them. Yeah. He he is the owner of Ben Media Group International Media Consultancy, and I am also joined by my co-host Carlos. And the first question we have for you, Glenn, is could you explain to the audience at home a little bit about your company, the Ben oh. the Ben Media Company? Yeah. Yeah. Great, thank what you very much. What do you do and what brings you here? Awesome, great to be with both of you and great to be with all of our friends who are online. So sorry that you cannot be here. It is absolutely gorgeous here. Uh, I've already been in Hawaii uh, this trip for uh, almost two weeks. Came a week early uh, to have a little va vacation time. And I've been here uh, earlier this week with the East West Center International Media Conference uh, 2022 uh, as a former journalist. Uh, so I was a journalist for 20, over 25 years. CNN International and, uh, and CNBC Asia and many others. I started my company Van Media Group about 15 years ago. Uh, we do consulting. So we do uh, executive coaching for communication and for media training and presentation skills. And we also train journalists across the Asia Pacific region. I'm based in Singapore. I've been there for 19 years, but I've lived in Asia for almost 30 years in Tokyo and Hong Kong as well. So that's what we do. Great. And most importantly, of course, you're an alumni of the East West Center yourself. You had an opportunity to join us some years ago for the Jefferson Fellow, I recall. Can you say a word about that, what that sure. experience meant for you, and really any takeaways from that? Absolutely. Uh, it was exactly 20 years ago this year that I was a Jefferson Fellow, uh, which was the last time that I was here and on campus at the East West Center. And, and the fellowship, as uh, some of you may or may not know, is for mid career journalists mostly to take some time off from their uh, from their working careers. Uh, most recently, the program's about a month long, it used to be longer, six or nine months long. Uh, but I was here for the month long program and we traveled uh, not only here to Honolulu, but then we were in Tokyo and also back in uh, Washington state um, discussing journalistic issues. Each Jefferson Fellowship program has a theme that they follow and, and then we uh, interview and visit media organizations and, and government officials uh, in the appropriate countries. I think it's an awesome, the media programs are fantastic at the East West Center and um, anyone who's interested in journalism or is a journalist, I, I highly recommend you look into them, but it's a great opportunity for journalists to step back for just a minute from very busy lives and deadlines that we all face and have a chance to uh, reconnect with journalism issues at a higher level. And of course, a lot of times these are people to people exchanges. You went, joined a group, got to tour. Uh, they have it often they have, uh, I guess, effects that aren't immediate. I mean, you meet people, you have it, but it's kind of a long term enduring. And from that experience now, many years ago, uh, can you uh, share anything? I mean, how, how it has continued to be an enduring, I don't know, experience. It wasn't just a one off, but it helped to develop some connections, some open some new doors in different ways. Yeah, Susan Kreifels and Ann Hartman and those who are uh, putting those programs together do a great job of selecting a, a wide range of people. Mm -hmm. And so on our program, we had folks from Taiwan, from uh, uh, China, from the US, from Pakistan, mm -hmm. um, all across Asia. And uh, I'm not in touch with everybody anymore, but, but many, yeah. many of us are. Excellent. And so uh, then you find as a journalist, if you're doing a story in one of those countries or about one of those countries, all of a sudden you've got somebody you can connect with and say, hey, you know, would you be a source? Would you be able to do an interview? 
or who could I talk to, that yeah. sort of thing. So the connections are strong. Uh, as many of our uh, folks watching who are alumni know, we've got 68,000 or so alumni uh, throughout the East West Center programs. And that is a powerful, powerful network of people who not only care about the vision of the East West Center and bringing yeah. East and West together in a positive way, but also are generally speaking at the top of their game or the top of their field uh, and have great experience, knowledge, and something to share. Since the theme of, of this, this conference is reconnecting, I'm, I'm actually very curious about your experience in, in Asia. Were there any challenges that you faced during your time in Asia being a reporter? <laughs> well, I've been in Asia for 30 years, so I, I don't think we have enough time for me to talk about the challenges. Uh, but, um, well, you know, generally speaking, I think first and foremost, you have to look at culture, right? So I grew up in the States, I grew up in Chicago. And uh, so then coming to Asia, you know, you have to somehow figure out the cultural sensitivity. And the, and the cultural issues that you face, right? You cannot approach covering news uh, in Asia if you're from outside of Asia and think that it's all the same. It, of course it's not. Uh, second is language. When I lived in, and worked in Tokyo, I spent a great deal of time studying Japanese and learning Japanese. So I was to the point where I was functional and, and able to communicate and do uh, basic interviews, not technical interviews, but basic interviews in Japanese, which you know, as anyone knows who speaks a second or third or more languages, you pick up cultural nuance by speaking that language that you just cannot get through a translator. Uh, and so I think that's a huge element of it. Um, and other than that, I, I didn't have any um, particular challenges with um, it, it, being homesick or fitting in or whatever. I, I always enjoyed the international experience. And, and most of my reporting um, over the years was reporting stories for the US audience. Uh, and so it was, I felt very committed to the fact that uh, American audiences needed to understand what was happening in Asia to the best of my ability to explain it to them. What were your, your favorite moments about working in, in Asia? Oh, uh, wow, that's uh, a fantastic question. I think always we have the people to people contacts are, are, are always the most memorable. But just 25 years ago, uh, this week, I was covering the handover in Hong Kong. I was living in Hando in Hong Kong at the time. And so when you look at world events like that, you know, just how important they were um, and the changes we've seen in Hong Kong, uh, then that's, you can debate both sides of, of that uh, question. Um, but just to, just to see the arc of history and the arc of stories. And I, I landed in Japan as a journalist shortly after the emperor passed away. And so it was a new era in Japan as well in the late 80s, uh, 80, 1989, when I first arrived in Tokyo as a, as a journalist. So you can see, uh, you know, you can see, like I say, the, the arc of stories, the arc of history, and the arc of culture. We also had, especially in the early uh, 90s, uh, you know, the Asian tigers, right? Like Korea, like Malaysia at the time was being talked about that, Singapore, um, and just seeing how they have all, some have developed very positively and others have not developed to their potential Malaysia. as once was thought. So being here this week so far with the media conference and today the start of the alumni conference shows the strength of the organization and the reach of the organization. And, uh, and, and I think, as you mentioned, this moment in history where everybody seems to be splitting apart further than ever in many countries, uh, the right. US included and, and, and the Philippines and wherever else you wanna look, mm -hmm. um, it is more important than ever that, that our mission those of us who know, believe in, and love the East West Center, um, that we push that mission forward to connect people, to connect governments, to connect on issues uh, that should be uniting us and not dividing us. And we need that more than ever. Um, and so I just would hope anyone who's, who wasn't able to come here, but you do that in your own way, whatever way that is, wherever you are. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, always keep the East West Center front and, front and center in your mind. Thank you so much for those. Thank you. Thank you, you so interview? much. Thank you for taking the time to interview with us. Great Back to the studio. Insight. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And welcome. We're joined now by Annalisa Burgos, our Master of Ceremonies, who is not only a distinguished alumni, perhaps more importantly, a distinguished, oh no, no, I meant to say a distinguished journalist <laughs> yes. with Hawaii News Now, but more importantly, she's a distinguished alumni from the East West Center. Mm -hmm. So let me thank you again for your help in, you know, getting the program moving. 
uh, for your, especially at the opening remarks that helped to kind of place the, can you this? no, 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 you're no, good you're right fine. now. <laughs> uh, but I wonder if you might share with us again, any you know takeaways that you have, uh, your impressions. I mean, you, you've obviously been an integral part of our program here, but you've had a chance to reconnect with some people for the first time in a while. Yes. Uh, share with some of our viewers that are joining hey. us from all over the world. Aloha, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us uh, on virtual. It would have been nice to see all of your beautiful faces in person. Uh, I'm based here in Hawaii, but I was an anchor in Singapore and in the Philippines. So I have a very uh, attachment, a strong attachment with the East West Center. I went to a couple of their conferences, the last one in New Delhi, wow. and it was amazing. Um, so yeah, so although I'm based here in Hawaii now, my heart is with the international community. Mm -hmm. And Hawaii really is a hub for the international community. So I'm so glad that so many of our fellow journalists and alumni were able to come after three years of being locked down, right? Oh my gosh, it was so depressing. And I think, um, Having uh, being a journalist here in Hawaii, uh, we talk about just how devastated our economy has been because we rely on international visitors like mm -hmm. yourselves. Yes. Everyone, uh, we we just need this injection of investment for all of you guys to enjoy and come and you know. So welcome back. You know, hopefully your respective countries uh, will open up and have less restrictions. Uh, and then you know, when you're in town, let me know. I'm on social media. Would be <laughs> would be great to uh, connect with fellow alum from all over the world. That's yeah. awesome. Well, thank you so much, Ani. And it really is about reconnecting. That's what we're doing here, yes. reopening to the world, uh, reminding everybody what we're about, but bringing people together. Mm -hmm. yes. yes, yes. Thank you so much for having me and thank enjoy you. the rest of the conference. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you again thank you for, for your role. Thank you for taking the time to introduce us. Of course. <laughs> yes. of course. We, we need to share all of our stories. Yes. So um, it's such an important aspect of the center. So. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much. Okay, Annalisa Burgos joining us Bye. today from Hawaii Back to News the Now. <laughs> Aloha. Aloha. Where <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt your conversation. I know you're anxious to talk to each other, but this is such an important part of our program gathering where we honor each other and where we honor the outstanding chapter. So today we will be recognizing the 2022 EWCA Outstanding Volunteer, the 21st Century Outstanding Service Award and Outstanding Chapter Awards and the EWC Distinguished Alumni Award. The first award is for recognizes, it's the Outstanding Volunteer Award and recognizes outstanding alumni volunteers who have provided significant contributions to the programs and activities of the East West Center Association. The awardees lead by example, demonstrating the qualities that bring out the best in others. The recipient of the 2022 EWCA Outstanding Volunteer Award is Professor, um, Professor Emerita Keiko Yamazato of Okinawa Christian University. Those of us, Keiko. Now, Keiko can't be here in person. She's with us in spirit, but we have Ms. Yukiko Miyazato, who will be accepting the award on behalf of Ms. Yamazato. So we have President Varazlan and Representative Ward, who will be presenting the award to her. Well, to Keiko, for, uh, to um, Yukiko. While she's getting the award for Keiko, I'm going to read about Keiko. Keiko was a participant in the Institute for Student Exchange. She has an MA, got a, receiving her MA in teaching English as a second language. And she served as president of the EWCA Okinawa chapter from 2012 to 2016. She spearheaded a fundraising campaign among the Okinawa alumni to establish the center's EWCA Okinawa Chapter Endowment Fund in 2013. With steering committee members from the Okinawa Chapter alumni, she led the successful 2014 EWC, EW, EWCA International Conference where more than 400 people gathered in Naha, Okinawa. How many were there? How many were there in Okinawa? Lots of us, lots of us. <laughs> 
Thank you so much. And let's give Keiko and Yukiko another round of applause. This, this is a fairly new award that has been established. It's the 21st Century Outstanding Service Award. This award recognizes East West Center participants who became involved in an EWC program after the year 2000 and who have provided outstanding community service through activities that strengthen intercultural understanding, economic and social empowerment, and civic engagement. The recipient of the 2022 EWCA 21st Century Outstanding Service Award is Ramey Innocencio. Ramey. Now, Ramey had wanted to be with us. He planned to be with us. But for those of you who may have been watching the news just the other night, he is on assignment in Ukraine. He was in Kyiv. Uh, reporting as the bombing happened. So um, he did send a message to us, but I'm going to read about him for those who might not know Remy. Remy Innocencio was an Asia Pacific Leadership Program Fellow from 2009 to 2010, and an Asia Pacific Journalism oh. Fellow in 2019. He has two decades of experience reporting across Asia, America, and Europe, and just landed in London as CBS News' new foreign correspondent covering Europe and the Middle East. Prior to London, Mr. Innocencio served as CBS News Asia correspondent based in Beijing from 2019 to 2021. He was the first US network correspondent to report from Wuhan, China, just as a COVID-19 global pandemic broke out in January, 2020. He then reported from South Korea and Japan following the spread of the virus and was subsequently stranded in Japan for half a year as international borders shut. He also provided rolling coverage from Hong Kong of the entirety of the 2019 pro-democracy pro -democracy protests from the front lines, enduring tear gas, pepper spray, and rubber bullets. If you catch Ramey, it's always so great for those of us who know him and see him right in the midst of so many conflicts. Before joining CBS News, Innocent Rainey um, was a New York-based anchor and correspondent for Bloomberg Daybreak. Um, at Bloomberg Television, he covered the first face-to-face -face summit between President Donald Trump and Chinese President Xi Jinping from Mar-a-Lago. He reported from Paris on the 2016 Bastille Day terror attacks and traveled across the United States in 2015 for Wiring World with his technology innovation. While in New York, in addition to everything else, he was president of the East West Center EWCA New York chapter from 2016 to 2019. And I know he relied on Bill Armbruster a lot for that. Thank you, Bill, for providing that support. He remains very active with the East West Center and the East West Center Association and co emceed the 2021 EWC, EWCA International Virtual Conference. So now I hope we have a message from Remy. Well, oh, in the back All right, here. Aloha from, from Kyiv, Ukraine. Uh, I never thought that I'd be putting Aloha and Ukraine together, but there you go. I really wish that I could be with you all in person, but I'm reporting here on Russia's invasion of the country. Right now I'm in the center of the capital and that is the beautiful there you go, Golden Dome, St. Sophia Cathedral, which, as I learned, is nearly a thousand years old. I'm honored to be the recipient of this year's 21st Century Outstanding Service Award, but I can honestly say that I can think of so many of our Ohana who deserve this award. So for this, I really am truly humble too. I'll make this brief, but through the, the lens of war that I'm seeing right now, I'll just say that it is even more important for us all to stand together, to promote dialogue, to understand, and to respect all the people and all the cultures that we meet. And so it's important for the East-West Center to be as strong as it can be, as strong as we can be. We're all providing our own, if you will, uh, outstanding service by spreading that message of respect for differences and respect for diversity everywhere we go, really. So again, thank you so, so much for humbling me with this year's service award. Thank you to the East West Center. And I want to send my love, aloha, and a shaka from Ukraine. Take care. So um, we'll make sure that Remy gets his award. 
Um, we're not going to travel to Ukraine to deliver it to him, but we'll make sure when he's out and safe, we'll give it to him. Then the next award goes to the EWCA Outstanding Chapter Award recipient, and this is the Southern California chapter. Congratulations to the Southern California chapter. The EWCA Southern California chapter is led by a committed group of individuals who support the mission of the center and the goals of this EWCA. The chapter has a track record uh, that is decades long, exemplifying the talents and passions of EWC associates under the leadership of Rinaldo Garay, Christine, Christine Suto, Claire Langham, and currently Ingham Maranto, who will be accepting the award on behalf of the chapter. The chapter utilized EWCA chapter development funds to hold a hybrid conference on September 11th to 12th, 2021 in Orange, California. The chapter's vision for the conference was to gain insight into how the EWC experience impacted members' lives professionally and personally, seeing transformational inclusion in relationships, communities, and organizations. Two days of presentations documented the contributions of EWC alumni associates since the early 1960s to raise awareness for respect and to encourage protection of all people who live in the Indo-Pacific Rim. So thank you, the Southern Chapter. <laughs> Melissa, you're part of this group apparently. Melissa, stand up, you're running so much. She should be up here, but she's busy working. Okay, thank you, Melissa. All right, did we recognize everybody from the Southern California? Let's give them another round of applause because it's... Okay, thank you folks. Now we move on to the East West Center Distinguished Alumni Awards. These are for individuals. The Distinguished Alumni Award recognizes outstanding accomplishments, including significant contributions to the promotion of better relations and understanding among the countries of East and West to activities of cultural and technical interchange. Significant achievements in one's career and continuing support of the goals of the East-West Center. The award was established and endowed by Dr. Dai Ho Chun, former director of the East-West Center's Institute for Technical Interchange. Two outstanding alumni will, will receive this award today. Our first recipient is Alan Miller. Alan Miller also unfortunately can't be here with us today. He had planned to come, but he did have a message for us. Alan Miller is a participant in communication um, with a master's degree in political science in 1976 to 78. He was at the East West Center. He's a recipient of the 2022 East West Center Distinguished Alumni Award for demonstrated excellence and achievements in his initial and second careers which are both worthy of recognition. Building on the skills and cross-cultural experience he gained at the center, Alan has demonstrated integrity, determination, vision, creativity, courage, and professional commitment to journalism and education, and has remained a supporter of the East West Center goals. Alan spent 29 years as an award-winning journalist, most of them as an invest investigative reporter in the Washington Bureau me, of the Los Angeles Times. He also received more than a dozen state and national honors. His vertical vision series on the Marine Corps Harrier attack jet won the 2003 Pulitzer Prize for national reporting. Alan left the Los Angeles Times in 2008 to start the News Literacy Project. The News Literacy Project is a nonpartisan national education nonprofit that creates resources and programs for educators and the general public. These resources are used to teach and learn how to determine what news and other information to trust and give people the ability to be equal, informed, and engaged participants in democracy. He had some information here that we used had handouts for the media conference. He has been phenomenal with this and a lot of his educational materials are actually even used here in the Department of Education in Hawaii. So he has reached out to education, educators across the whole country with this really important program. 
The um, NLP is now the leading provider of news literacy education nationally, if not globally. So we do have a clip from Alan who will give us his message. I appreciate those kind words, Karen. I wish I could be there with all of you in person, but I'm there in spirit. Thank you so much, President Varislam, Jim Scott, and the Alumni Association for this very special and meaningful honor. A heartfelt mahalo goes to my former East West Center colleague and friend Tina Brar, who is with you for having nominated me. My time at the center was one of the most consequential and enriching experiences of my life. I had previously spent a college semester in Japan, but it was my time in Honolulu and through such experiences as attending programs at Jefferson Hall, enjoying the camaraderie and international cuisines at food co-ops in Halimanoa, co-editing the student magazine Impulse and gaining a master's degree at UH that opened up the rest of Asia and the Pacific for me. It was there that I formed deep friendships that have lasted nearly half a century. As an aspiring journalist, I enjoyed helping host Jefferson Fellows from Japan, Singapore, and Thailand, and I'm delighted to see that this program is still thriving. My field study was a highlight of my experience. I was fortunate to land an internship in the Washington Post Tokyo Bureau three years after the paper broke the Watergate scandal. I got to shadow the Post East Asian Bureau Chief, complete a project on the American press in Japan, and wrote two stories that were published in the paper. Heady stuff for a 23-year-old. My internship with the Post led to my first full-time newspaper job working for Harry Rosenfeld, who had been Woodward and Bernstein's boss at the paper during Watergate. Harry had just left the post to edit two newspapers in Albany, New York, and I was his first hire. He was an exacting and inspiring boss and became a lifelong friend and mentor. When I left the center, I had hoped to become a foreign correspondent based in Tokyo, and years later was offered that chance at the LA Times. But by then I had found my calling as an investigative reporter in the paper's Washington Bureau. Yet I had one more special Asia sojourn in store. In 1998, I was awarded a Japan Society Fellowship and pursued two projects that reflected both the transcendent and the tawdry side of Japan. For one, I interviewed six Ningen Kokuho, living national treasures, masters of traditional crafts and arts, including the country's foremost bunraku puppeteer and a sword maker who restored swords of the samurai. For the other, I dug into Japan's shadowy campaign finance practices, comparing them to what I had unearthed in my investigative work on the subject in the US and turned this into a page one story for the LA Times. Since embarking on my second career with the News Literacy Project, it has been gratifying to make connections with my center experience as well. Educators in 25 countries in Asia and the Pacific have registered to use our Czechology virtual classroom and the Yomiri Shimbun has made some of our other resources available in Japan. Leading Asian news outlets have done pieces on us as well. Moreover, educators in Hawaii have used Czechology since 2017 to reach more than 1,400 students, and we have forged a strong and growing partnership with the Hawaii Department of Education. Recently, President Varis Lam has become an effective champion for NLP and news literacy across the state as well. In the end, it is the close friendships forged at the center that have been the most meaningful. This includes Stu Glauberman, my roommate in Holly Manoa and co-editor of Impulse, who remained in Hawaii, and Ian Gill, a colleague at the Communications Institute who settled in the Philippines, as well as Tinu. For all of us, Mike Anderson was an extraordinary friend at the center and for more than four decades thereafter, who we lost much too soon a year ago this month. Throughout his long, distinguished career as a diplomat in Asia, Mike epitomized the values of the center in promoting understanding, mutual respect, and cooperation. He won this award in 2002. I am honored to follow in his footsteps and in those of others who have come before me. Thank you again for this treasured recognition and for the chance to reflect on how much the center and my experiences in Hawaii have meant to me. Very moving. Um, our next recipient, I'm so delighted to introduce uh, Gondolkar 
Prevjev. Ghana is a participant in Changing Faces Leadership Program 2014, and she's the recipient of this award today. She is a well-respected woman leader, best-selling author, coach, and mentor in Mongolia, who incorporates East-West Center values through her expansion of the services with the Ghana Bell Institute of Success. Ghana has transformed the field of coaching, mentoring, and delivering of a successful service to not only the private sector, but to HR professionals, public sector leaders, effective management advisory services, as well as reaching out to the most rural and remote youth through Mongolia on educational empowerment. She assisted with the launch of the EWCA Ulaanbaatar chapter in 2019 with the US Embassy in Mongolia and continues her con contributions to the promotion of better relations and understanding of the East-West Center. Since the launch, she, in she initiated the Adaptive Leadership Program with the EWC and Ganabel Institute, increasing the membership of the EWCA Ulaanbaatar chapter with an additional 110 members across 21 provinces in Mongolia. Ghana, we, we salute you. She's going to say a few words. It's my honor to receive this prestigious award. This award is not only for me, but also to our team and our chapter. I, I'm the alumni of the Changing Faces of Leadership Program in 2014. So I was mesmerized by the intensive program and I decided to become the authentic leader to contribute my efforts to our Mongolian community. Mongolian all saying that life is all about giving. More you give, more you receive. So this award is one of the indicators uh, for me to measure my contribution to our community. Thank you. Let's give a final round of applause to all of our recipients. Just to know that some of these people are in our midst and we know there are many, many more. It's humbling, I think, for all of us. It, I think all of us have played a role and it's just so great. So now I would like to have um, invite our president, uh, Susie Veras Lum, to get, um, say a few closing remarks and get us ready for the next important phase that I think you'll find pretty exciting. So Susie. Thank you so much, Karen. And thank you everyone, all the hands. And thank you to all of our distinguished alumni who are awarded today. Another round, please. You know, I gotta say, if you were able to read just the amazing um, breadth and depth of experiences of all the alumni who were put forth as nominations for distinguished alumni, it was incredible. You know, when we think about the investment in one person, and I said it before, but each and every one of you just going around the tables, I mean, I can pick out all these people here and I think about all the things that you've done. So it is such an honor to be able to, to recognize our, our sister, East West Center sister from Mongolia and our brother from DC. That's how we think of ourselves at the East West Center Ohana here. You know, um, certainly when we talk about the meaning and the, of the East West Center mission that has been said so many times or the vision that I mentioned that we really invest in our emerging leaders. Cause you heard the stories, right? You heard Alan talk about when I was a 23 year old, the opportunities I were given, I was given. These are the investments in our emerging leaders who make a difference to become who you, many of you here are today and what you've contributed. So, you know, before I um, continue on to invite you to break out sessions on the priorities in small groups when we talk about our strategic plan, because we have at the East West Center, because of your stories, focused our strategic plan on number one, the leader, that emerging leader that's gonna make a difference to make a change in these issues that we talked about this week on governance, free and open media, the environment that we heard about on climate and our unique place in the Pacific. 
but we can invest in research and we can talk about it all day. But if you don't give the tools to the leaders like you, then we kind of failed our mission, but we're not going to because you're here. We've got all of you together for us to move forward. Um, but before I do that, I'd like to, you know, Jim's doc, Dr. Jim Scott could not be here, but we're so honored to have our, our board of governors here as well representing Jim Scott as representative Jean Ward, who is also East West Center alumni. So I'd like to call him up very quickly to say a few words and then I will close us. Thank you, Susie. Aloha, my kako. Aloha. Welcome back to Hawaii for those of you who've been away. We've missed you, but thank all of you for being here. Thank you for making the world a better place. If you listen to some of the sessions, it's like, you know, the East West Center is still the epicenter of better understanding in the world between peoples, between countries. And to see we've got one of our people in uh, Ukraine, uh, the Mongolian lady knows the former East West Center, Pam Slutz, who was ambassador to, to Mongolia. This is the world that the East West Center is making a better place to live in. I see it as the epicenter of soft power for not only the Pacific, but for the world. We're an example. Having said that, I want you to know that in the 70s when I was there, a long time ago, President Susie, I met someone charming to the point where we had to get married. That was my wife, Farida. Farida, would you please stand and be recognized as part of the East West Center family? But I wanna use you as, a, as an example. How many of you met your spouse at the East West Center? Look, Madam President, look at this, because this is what I saw 10 years ago that 30 to 40% of you were match made here. Having said that, thank you for your attendance. Thank you for the great contribution to making the world a better place. Thank you and aloha. Okay, before I close, thank you so much, Representative Ward. I, um, next, you're invited, of course, to join one of the five breakouts based on the priorities um, in a small group we kind of take advantage of having you here. So we really appreciate if you're willing to break out into these small groups. Number one is what are the important issues for the region? I think we heard a lot this week, but would like to hear it from you. Two, you know, what have you experienced, particularly at the East West Center that successfully focuses on these challenges and opportunities? And I think one thing that remains constant, the challenges may change and morph, but the human nature remains the same. So whether you were here in the 60s, 70s, 80s, the way in which you approach the wisdom that you bring is much needed today. So number three, what are the key programs and activities that you as East West Center alumni could expand or start that address these challenges and opportunities? We hear, you know, we saw the California team, like what are you doing? What are those best practices, right? That we could learn and we could bring in not just in the United States, but across the world. So I look forward to hearing the results of the conversations to get feedback. We all are in the staff and our executive leadership team with the uh, vice president, um, Dr. T Satu LeMay, as well as chief operating officer back there, uh, ambassador Bob Riley, former ambassador to the FSM. With that, thank you to uh, all of our team. I'll turn it back over to you, Karen. Thank you again for being so gracious. It's not hard to be excited when I look out and see everyone. So um, thank you, Susie. Thank you, Representative Ward. Thank you all very much. And we'll see you later. Thank you. Aloha, everyone. Good, good morning. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's so interesting to see uh, so many amazing uh, people and amazing uh, alumni being celebrated and I think you know I, I could see a very strong reaction from some of our fellows from uh, the zoom as well so Iyanga do you want to share a little how you feel when you saw Ghana um, actually winning the award Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm so happy to be here joining you guys from Zoom. Uh, I'm a Mongolian alumni too, and uh, I'm so happy that one of our fellow Mongolians got the award this year. And uh, with her leadership during the COVID time, especially, she took a lead on 
uh, doing training for Mongolians all through online. When everything was locked down, we couldn't leave our house and anything. And she took the lead and a lot of uh, the Mongolian alumni got together from different parts of the world to do training called Adaptive Leadership. And I'm just so happy that she was recognized today. You know, consider we have only 3 million population and a little over 100 uh, alumni. It's so great that, you know, uh, the, then we get to give back to our community, even though we may be not physically here, there in Mongolia, we were able to collaborate. I'm so happy to see that. Thank you. Here, but we're taking advantage, obviously, of, of the many people who've come to join us today. And we're joined today. Claire, would you be able to say a few words? Yes. And let's see, both of you, are you from the Southern California yes, chapter, absolutely. right? I actually won the um, 21st Century Award a few years ago. Well, congratulations. And I understand you've come to receive another award. Is it the, yes. the chapter? Would you like me to Yes, take? please bring it. And I received an award in Bali for the out, an outstanding volunteer. Well, everywhere you Last go, century. you're just outstanding. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> The center means a great yeah. deal to us. It, uh, this is for our chapter. Excellent. And what we are very interested in, what our chapter has promoted, mm -hmm. not just one person, not just two people, but everyone in the chapter, everyone. A uh, very active group. And we promote uh, the multiplier effect and understanding how people who are inclusive, how we get along with one another, and how coming together is like synergy. Um, synthesis and energy that by doing things together, whatever differences we have, more important to come together because we share so much that we have in common. Excellent. Very nice words. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, Dr. Khan, anything you can share about, again, your, your reflections, uh, takeaways from this day? It's a very special time bringing together so many people. Well, I was at the uh, media conference yesterday. Mm -hmm. I was uh, a part of a panel that yeah. talks about disasters and disaster resiliency. Mm -hmm. And um, what I find is that uh, East West Center bringing together just the different types of people. Mm -hmm. I'm a journalist myself as well as a physician. And so mm -hmm. just, I'm so attracted to the programs because of the content of the programs, but also because of the diversity of the people. Yeah. Um, I, I will be forever grateful to the East West Center. I, been in their two of their fellowship programs for journalists, disaster fellowship and then the health journalism mm -hmm. fellowship. So I think that um, especially nowadays, we couldn't anticipate it, but now with the media and the press under attack, um, it's very important for us to retain our independence and autonomy because if you don't have a free press, you don't have a government watchdog mm -hmm. and you don't have um, many of the things that we associated with the democracy. So yeah. free press is very important. And I'm very proud that East West Center promotes it. Great, thank you so much for those great words. Go ahead. I, I was gonna say, um, the lessons I learned and the uh, events at the East West Center and the friendships, I lived overseas 15 years in Asia, predominantly Indonesia and India, but I've been in 14 Asian countries, then in Latin America for five years with the uh, diplomatic corps, and then in Turkey, another five years. So. Um, I, my degrees are in four different areas. But I think the importance of what uh, Dr. Khanna said and what I imparted to my students as a professor of doing things together, we're stronger doing things together and our diversity is something to celebrate in inclusiveness. Thank you so much. Those are great words and we're really grateful for all you've done to bring again perspective, insights, reconnecting, that's what it's all about. Exciting. Oh. So we also have exciting uh, conversations and sessions coming forward. So um, just to recap some of the things that we're going to be covering for the rest of the conference. Um, right now, we are going to do a bunch of cultural workshops. So those are really exciting because you will be um, sort of exposed to um, hula classes and then there's also going to be lay making. Um, that is going to be covered even um, for virtual participants. And lastly, we're also going to do um, origami, um, origami folding classes.
welcome back to EWC EWCA International Conference. Again, my name is Panwin Yoking. I am a research fellow at the East West Center and I am at Cultural Workshop 3 this afternoon watching um, Carolyn Iguchi. She's the pro program officer doing leading the origami session. And we have all the beautiful ladies currently making the origami session. And I'm going to briefly pass the mic to each of them for them to briefly introduce themselves and where they're from. Hello, I'm Magali from Peru. Oh, hi, my name is Sulve Fuentes, and this is my first East West Center conference, and it's been really amazing. That's awesome. And now I'm learning to fold origami. That's beautiful. So, and I made a shirt, so it's pretty exciting. Thank you so much. <laughs> I made two courses, okay? 62 to 64. Wow, that's awesome. So, I, I, but I live here, so I try to come each time. Okay. When you have a session. Thank you. Okay, that's wonderful. Hi, I'm Cindy Iwasaki. I'm a staff member here at East West Center. And my first story comes. <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Tina. I'm one of the fiscal officers here at the East West Center. And this is my Aloha shirt with the uh, logo. <laughs> that's beautiful. And Carolyn, do you have a few words to say to our Zoom yeah, audience? Aloha, everyone out in Zoom. Man. Thank you so much for connecting. And um, we, you can all make this. It's really easy. There's a step-by-step -step instructions right here. Take a picture of it, blow it up, and enjoy it. Have fun. And these are different types of sizes that you can, you can even make it with a dollar bill or Thank you for coming to our table and joining us. Aloha. Thank you. Uh, one, of the, one of the cultural workshops, which is uh, giving us an illustration of lei making, this important Hawaiian tradition. Uh, they brought together a lot of different, uh, well, we have a, one of the master lei makers uh, who's here with us. Anyhow, what we're seeing is the making of these leis, which are very much an integral part of Hawaiian culture. Uh, many of them will be able to use them here very shortly for the reception to follow. But uh, it's a good example, again, of how we connect to our culture. And here in Hawaii, of course, the lei, the flower lei, is such a beautiful blessing. And they brought different flowers here from Oahu to show how they are weaved together, put into different forms, the haku lei that's used in the head, other type of lei. So let's have a look, see, and take a, take a look at some of the workshop that they're showing here. Different styles that can be worn on the wrist or as hair adornments. All right, are we having fun? Yes, we have uh, an audience joining us by Zoom all over the world, other alumni who couldn't be here today, but they're joining us by Zoom. So you are showing them this important art of lay making. So for many of you, this is the first time making lays. Ah, well, that after you perfect the art, you'll be able to share it and show your, your friends and family, uh, very important. I see some pretty good experienced lay makers here. Ooh. Okay. Looking very beautiful. So fun fact about the hula is that traditionally it was performed by the men. It was only later when um, hula dance is picked up by women, which is also quite interesting because in you know, when we think of hula dances, a lot of um, a lot of the impression that we have is by women, but it's actually mostly by um, yeah, it was traditionally by men, and um, so 
if you actually notice, uh, one of our instructors is actually an East West Center staff. So her name is Lori and she is amazing. So yeah, that's her in red. And as you can see, everyone's having a really good time um, dancing the hula. Um, and so originally, hula is a religious dance trained by perform, uh, it's performed by trained dancers before the king or ordinary people to promote um, and honor the gods and to praise the chief. So those are, I mean, you know, it's a very sacred um, practice. And, um, and then you also use wristlets and anklets of whale teeth or bone and necklaces. So like, you know, um, necklaces and fillets of lace were common ornaments um, that was done uh, when dancing the hula. So the women, um, if you notice those, those skirts that the women were wearing, it's got house. And the men, they would wear tapa loincloths or malos um, originally. Unfortunately, um, you know, during the missionary, uh, in the 18, 1800s, the missionaries actually um, compelled the native people to wear, to replace the hula skirts with um, long dresses. So um, because it was seen back then as to be too sensual you know even though it wasn't um it wasn't seen as sensual in the hawaiian culture but now um contemporary hula it usually tells stories folklores and describes places um through different movements so if you actually notice the movements would um, actually, if, if you notice like all the movements actually signify something, so it can be a place, it can be, um, it, uh, it can also describe a story. So let's watch what um, our group here is doing and then we can sort of see. So yeah, um, and if you notice that, like, you know, the people will be bending their knees, that's where the hip movement comes. And then, yeah, so, and yeah, so uh, movement from the hand to to the, I mean, from the mouth to the, I mean, further. And yeah, so all of these movements actually signify um, a, a meaning um, to every single move. So it's, which is very exciting. So yeah, it's very exciting for me to hear. Um, and yeah, so like some of this, um, the, the hula is usually, um, it comes with uh, music. So the common music is called, um, it, sometimes it is accompanied by ukulele and steel guitar, but the old style hula is called hula kahiko. Um, it is usually uh, us uh, using traditional instruments called kalabash, uh, which is a seed filled gourd, split bamboo sticks, stones, used as castanets and pahu drums. So those are very exciting. Um, yeah, um, those are very exciting stuff. And hopefully one day we will be able to join together and dance the hula with the rest of the, the rest of them. So yeah, it looks very fun. And then you can see uh, the ukulele is actually um, accompanying the, the dance. Well, we're joined now by Robert, who's coming from Indonesia, right? Yeah. And show us what you've got. You've put together a beautiful lay. There you go. Yeah. Excellent. Um, tell us uh, uh, yeah. any reflection, I mean, on this or any, any part of the conference that you do. Right, enjoy. right. Yeah, well, uh, I'm part of the FPLP program. It's the Asia Pacific Leadership Program. Yeah. So uh, I just arrived here for a week now. Excellent. And yeah, well, this has been a, like a great uh, conference. I learned a lot, you know. Excellent especially like the lay matching today <laughs> and it, a lot of like similarities between Indonesia and the Hawaiian actually like you know the way we eat the way we make you know some kind of place as well uh it's been great excellent yeah. and what, what, what was your generation what year were you at the center for it's, this a, it's called g20 generation G20, yeah. 20 yeah excellent well thank you so much and I love your shirt though thank Fina you Kalo. so much yeah. uh, wonderful um, any other final takeaways? Again, maybe you, you've had a chance to reconnect. Have you visited? Have you seen some other alumni that you knew from your time? Yeah, here? yeah. It's been a humbling experience as well. You know, we've been meeting a lot of uh, alumni, mm -hmm. uh, even from like G3 or G6, even like 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we learned how the program actually made an impact in their career. 
and their society. So I'm hoping to do the same, I, I hope. Well, of course, and it's all about building these connections. And Definitely. Uh, we hope as you leave us today that you, you, you stay connected because it's all Definitely. about that. Well, thank you, Robert. Thank you for joining us and thank sharing a little so bit much. of your work. Thank you so much, yeah. So have here we have. Day. Thank you again. And uh, we're joined again, uh, many of these folks, for the first time uh, getting their hands dirty with some lay making. But it's a great experience, uh, experiential learning as they're learning by doing and also learning about this important cultural aspect of Hawaii here where we obviously make use of what we have, this beautiful land environment, the flowers, the fauna. That, and so we're going to be joined now by Panwin. He's going to tell us a little bit more about the origami that they're doing over there. Go ahead, Panwin. Welcome back, everyone. We're still at the origami session. And this, the beautiful ladies, they have upgraded from the Aloha t-shirt to a box. And now they have upgraded to a crane. And how's the crane going so far? Pretty good, pretty good. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you so much. Aloha, and now we are back with the hula dance. So as you can see, they are on it again. Uh, yeah, these people are really enjoying themselves with the hula. And it looks like, you know, they're a lot better um, from the last time we saw them. And I hope that they can bring this back to their communities and maybe um, share with them how to make, uh, how to do the hula. Um, it seems like this is a, a, a male group, you know, all the warriors are coming in. So I remember when I was telling you guys that um, traditionally um, hula is done by men and warriors, you know, as a religious performance, I mean, religious um, practice, you know, can definitely see that happening. Yeah. So that was really fun. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, I'm Dave Stilwell. I was a participant at the East West Center between 1987 and 88. Uh, other participants from that era are here, which is great as far as a reunion with old friends. Uh, and then I went on to do a full military career, and then I ended up at the State Department. Um, and I used all of the uh, training I got uh, at the East West Center in all of those jobs. So my last job, my current job is uh, I'm on the Board of Governors. That's awesome. And you were also in the Air Force? I was in the Air Force for 35 years. I came here from the Air Force Academy with a good friend, Carrick Chin, who lives here in Hawaii as well. And uh, we stay very closely connected, as do our wives. We all double dated in Hale Manoa when we were here. We ended up marrying our, we, find, we found our mates uh, here oh, wow. as well. Oh, that's awesome. So um, just a general question. What, what, are your, what are your thoughts and how do you feel about uh, being in person at this conference and meeting and reconnecting with your former friend, friends and colleagues? Well, I think we all have COVID fatigue. We've been uh, away from each other. We just haven't had a chance to interact personally and there's no substitute for getting together. And this is what the East West Center does best, right? Convening, bringing people from all over Asia Pacific uh, and Indo-Pacific and sitting down and, and eating together in Hale Manoa or here in these events, talking to each other, uh, rekindling relationships that have maybe lapsed for the last 20 years or so. Uh, and so, you know, Oahu means the gathering place and that's what we're doing here. We're gathering and it's great. That's awesome. And I had a chance to sit with Dave in the strategic planning earlier this afternoon and seeing his opinion and how he interacted with his uh, former friends. We also have a picture of him from, from 1988. Do you remember anything about that? Would you mind sharing to the audience? Right. So we all lived in Hale Manoa, as they still do. Uh, but there were many more participants, people sponsored by the East West Center and the University of Hawaii. Uh, and you was required to live in Hale Manoa and you were required to cook in the in the kitchens. Oh, wow. And so I had a Bangladeshi family to my right. I had a Chinese family to my left and me. Uh, and we would share food with each other and we would then eat together. And the picture you see uh, is I, I like to make pizza um, uh -huh. and bread. Wow. And, and so they made jiaozi, the Chinese dumplings, oh, and I made cool. pizza yeah. and beer. And uh, my mom was here visiting. And so oh, we were wow. all in this really cool group. And I'm in touch with several of those people still. Oh, that's so those long, those long relationships are really important. Yeah, so you are able to build long-lasting relationship through your EWC Ohana. Oh, that's awesome. And do you have any final words to say to, to the audience in terms of the takeaway or, or the highlights of this conference for today? Uh, the diversity of thought uh, is extremely important. And, and it's, you know, the thing I always, when I was a young fighter pilot, my lead, my, my boss would say, Dave, you've got one mouth and you've got two ears uh -huh. and you should talk and listen in those proportions. Uh, I think the one thing East West Center teaches Americans to do is to listen more 
to hear what the region region wants, what the region is interested in, and then to act on that. We tend to be loud. We tend to talk too much because of you know who the United States is. But uh, East West Center teaches us all of us uh, to be more uh, to listen more, and it's a very important skill. Got it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, any last words to share with young alumni who are watching at home about how they can advance their career through the East West Center program? Build networks. Again, the, stay in touch with people. Email, Skype, Zoom, all those things make it so easy to easier to stay in touch than it was in 1988 when you was all hand, you know, letters and stuff. We still manage to stay in touch, but please stay in touch because the people you know now, you will need in 20 years to accomplish what you need to, to uh, accomplish in whatever jobs you end up in. It's very important. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dave, for taking the time to interview with me today. And this is Panwin, back to the studio. Live from Honolulu. Thank you so much, Panwin. Um, yeah, so it's going to be really exciting right now. We are going to have the East West Center Association um, board meeting and um, the association represents 68,000, more than 68,000 individuals who have participated at the East West Center programs since it was established in the 1960s. I mean, you know, if you saw just now, even um, uh, uh, Deputy Secretary Silwell was also a part of part of the group, part of the network, and you can see, you know, a lot of like distinguished figures and members who are out there doing amazing things. And it's very exciting that you are part of this network too. So the East West Center Association, or otherwise also called the EWCA, provides many programs and services for its members throughout the Indo-Asia Pacific region, the United States, as well as other areas. And as you can see, we also they also have a lot of chapters all across um the US and also across Asia Pacific. Uh, and these services and programs are designed to support the census missions to help build an Asia Pacific community and to extend the outreach of the East West Center. So um you saw at the award alumni awards just now there were um one of the San Francisco actually won the award and there are 53 um East West Center Association chapters throughout. Um, the region, United States, and other areas. Um, yeah, so, and these chapters will facilitate professional networking through a variety of activities, including informal get togethers, seminars, lectures, and workshops. So, you know, wherever you are in your community, make sure you locate your nearest chapter and um, figure out uh, how you can be connected with the rest of the alumni chapter. It's a really great, um, it's a really great network of people that can link you up and build you a sense of community. So it's going to be really exciting today. They are going to have their board meeting and make sure that your voice is heard at the meeting. Feel free to join them. So we're going to head over there and thank you for tuning in. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to the uh, East West Center Alumni Association Executive Board Meeting. We're so glad that you could be with us today. Uh, we wanted to make this available to all members uh, just as a, a chance for you to see the uh, behind the curtain, the inner workings of the super secretive board. Uh, that is a joke, by the way. Uh, we will uh, have an opportunity to uh, talk to you about what we've been talking about uh, over the past couple of months. Uh, my name is Glenn Van Zutphen. I'm a board member. Uh, I was also a Jefferson Fellow in the year, uh, well, 20, exactly 20 years ago, so 2002, and uh, happy to be here with you. I've been here all week for the media conference, and uh, I am standing in today uh, for Subir, who is uh, the on screen number three down. Uh, Subir usually chairs these meetings, but he could not be here, uh, so I'm doing it in person today. Before we get started with the roll call, I just wanted to hand the microphone to Karen Knudsen to my right uh, for a few. She is co-president of the EWCA board for a couple of uh, welcoming comments. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. As a, the new co-president of this, I also bring you greetings from Amanda Ellis, the other person who has been president uh, of EWCA for several years. She's currently in Paris attending a UNESCO meeting, and she sends her greetings. She may actually be trying to watch us today. So Amanda, on behalf of everybody, we missed you. And also like to say greetings to all of our board members who are online. So with that, 
We hope it, Glenn will be emceeing this today as usually he's fabulous. And I'm going to turn the microphone back to Glenn. Thank you, Karen. One of the reasons I like Karen so much is that uh, I can always remember her name. You know, we've known each other only for about 15 years or so. So, uh, but anyway, uh, thank you very much, Karen. Uh, right now, I would like to uh, pass the floor to Christina, who will take the roll call for this meeting. Christina. Great. So, in person today, uh, Karen Knudsen, UWC co president. All right. Uh, we have Glenn Van Sutten is acting chair. Uh, I actually am not a board member. I'm the, the staff member that sits on the board non-voting um, along with my colleagues, of course, Noreen. And the, Tame is here, Vice President of Participant Engagement. Online, we have Bella, who is Vice President of the chapters. I see Carl Hefner, ex officio, great. Our chair, Sue Beer, and Keone Williams, terrific, our, is our uh, Participant representative. Also on the board, unable to be with us is Ronnie Adekara, Irid Agos, uh, of course, Amanda, who was mentioned, Ned Schultz, and uh, Maria Rana. Mm -hmm. And that is it. Absent, yes, we have Ramon, was unable to join us in person, unfortunately. Uh, Shigeo, uh, here in Hawaii, not able to, though. Clint, uh, Caitlin in Vietnam. And that's it for the board. That is it for roll call. Thank you, Christina. Our next order of business, as it always is, is the approval of the board minutes from the last meeting, which was held on April the 21st or 22nd, depending on uh, where we as members uh, were sitting in that online meeting. Uh, for members of the board who are joining us today, uh, first of all, are there any questions? Any questions from anyone online? Raise your hand or any additions or corrections? Any corrections here in the room? There being none, can I please have a, a motion to approve the board minutes from the April 21st, 22nd meeting? I move to approve. Okay, second, please. Second. Second by Karen Knudsen. And uh, all in favor, uh, just raise your hand if you're online, if you approve. Can they hear us? Yep, there you go. And any, any uh, okay, nope, that's everybody, okay. There we go, uh, the minutes are approved. Uh, the treasurer's report, uh, board members of those of you online, if you could please uh, look at that. Um, the, the bottom line, literally and figuratively, is we have about $6,000, uh, just over $6,000 in our account. Uh, for those of you and who are in the room, that is one of, our, uh, one of our areas that we will be looking at how to raise more funds so that we can be of more value to alumni, especially when it comes to things like uh, summer travel grants and things like that for students uh, and others. So we are uh, uh, consciously uh, thinking about the budget. So it is not a large number, but it is growing uh, apace. So we will keep uh, doing that. Uh, any of the board members, any questions or additions or corrections to the treasurer's report, please, if you're online, go ahead and raise your hand. We'll take your question. Okay, anybody here? Nope. All right, that being said, a motion from the floor to approve the treasurer's report. Move to approve. Great, second. Second. Second by Karen Knudsen, and we will go ahead and just approve that as, uh, as is. And next, we're gonna go through some uh, program committee reports for the benefit not only of the board, but also for those of you here, uh, so you can hear a little bit about what's happening. Uh, the first uh, report. Bella, are, are you, Bella, would you be able to talk a little bit about the program's uh, report? Uh, so for the chapter leadership workshop, we are, uh, we are planning to hold the second one on using social media to build chapter reach. And we will, uh, we set the date for uh, July 29th uh, from 4 to 5 p.m. for my time. And we will, this time, we will focus on some of the most popular social media tools like WhatsApp, WeChat, Facebook, and LinkedIn uh, to connect uh, alumni. Um, so that's all for now. Do you have any questions? Uh, thank you, Bella. Uh, I, I know it's, uh, it's, it's a bit hard to hear and understand what she's saying. Uh, we will, of course, be putting her report into the minutes so that will be available if, uh, if somebody wants to hear or, or read further uh, on that. Uh, and of course, we will make those uh, issues 
based on the chapter leadership workshop series that we're working on. That's what Bella was talking about. And also proposals to host the 2024 International Conference. We have another plan for the uh, alumni conference that will be also forthcoming as well. Christina, uh, would you like to just say a word or two about what's been happening with that in general, uh, so that those who are joining us in the in the talking about chapter development and the and the issues, some of the issues we're looking at, just so those in the room can understand a little bit more about what we're what we're doing. Sure. So on their behalf, I'll just quickly say that we launched a chapter leadership workshop series. So this isn't just for leaders; it is targeting them, but it's all those we're cultivating. Uh, emerging leaders for chapters as well as established leaders. The first one was conducted in quarter one. The next one is happening July 29th, as you heard her say. This is specifically the vote from chapter leadership was to be on building the reach of chapters through social media. So that will be hosted in uh, China, India, and Mongolia will be sharing the tools that they use in their chapters, WhatsApp, WeChat, uh, LinkedIn and different ways that they use those. We are going to be asking for proposals to host the 2024 International Conference. So that was, we welcome proposals from chapters to be hosting that. Um, and the last thing she would have shared would be a summary of quarter reports. So every quarter chapters submit written summaries uh, to the board and those can be shared as well. So thank you for the continued information that's provided. I know Bella appreciates it. Thanks, Christina. And, and just to add on, uh, just uh, briefly to what Christina mentioned about the chapter development, um, you know, we are mindful that our chapters uh, and our alumni spread many decades, many generations. And one of our concerns and one of our efforts is to make sure that the youngest generation of EWC alumni are represented in the chapters, are taking part in the chapters, and are ready to uh, move into leadership positions in years to come uh, with their ideas, their time, and their talents in the EWCA uh, chapters uh, all around the world. So that is a very important initiative to make sure that we keep chapters healthy and strong and contributing uh, to the East-West Center after they have left the programs. So that is something as a board that we are very mindful of and working very hard uh, to, uh, to make sure that we keep that uh, forward motion going. Again, if any of you have any ideas or suggestions on how to achieve that or specific programs that chapters could do to promote that, uh, that would be uh, much welcome by you. Uh, we in Singapore, for example, just a brief example, uh, have been reaching out in a, in a quite aggressive way. Cheryl Lee, uh, who is uh, with us, uh, is Cheryl here? Uh, in the room today. She's at the conference, but she, exa for example, just uh, put together um, our LinkedIn page uh, for Singapore. And so we have a place where we can come together uh, and share uh, ideas and things for uh, on LinkedIn um, with other EWC alumni. So we're trying to, of course, use technology and but make sure that we know who is in our cities and in our chapters and, and use uh, their time and their talents as, as we go forward. Okay, uh, let's move on to our, uh, our sixth item on the agenda, which is participant engagement and the participant engagement committee is headed up by Tane Duncan to my left, the VP for participant engagement. And uh, Tane will talk to us about a mentoring program and also uh, an update from the EWCPA. Tane, over to you. And thanks. That was actually a perfect segue because the mentoring program is another way that we on the board have been very focused on thinking about how we can use the resources and wisdom and talent of the generations of alumni that we have to help out the current participants and to help uh, put them in positions where they can become leaders when they are alumni. Uh, so the mentorship program is a way that we're trying to formalize that even before they're actually alumni while they're still participating with their programs. So the mentorship program in the past has primarily been something that has happened in person uh, with participants when they are on site at the East West Center. Of course, during 
uh, the time of, of COVID, we had to make some changes and that's actually opened up some new possibilities for building a more extensive mentoring network. Uh, so one of the things that I wanted to present on this evening and to talk about now that we've got a lot of alumni in the room is that we are looking to build a repository or a list of potential mentors, folks who would like to participate in the mentorship program, even if you are in other places in the world. Um, and we will be reaching out and working on building that more extensive list of mentorship opportunities. Um, we do usually try to target areas in which the participants are currently working. So in the past year, for example, there were specific areas of interest that the participants were engaged in and included things like uh, environmental sustainability and environmental science. It included things like government relations um, and it included things like law. Uh, but each group of participants might have different focus areas, so we'll be reaching out and asking you for areas in which you might have expertise and to see if you have an interest in being part of that more extensive mentorship network to help out our participants and to cultivate their capacities for leadership when they become alumni. Um, unfortunately, Shigeo could not be with us this evening. But Shigeo was one of our outstanding mentors in this past mentorship cycle, uh, or this current ongoing mentorship cycle. In fact, he's been specifically called out on being just an excellent mentor for current participants. And so I just wanted to acknowledge him. Um, that is what on your agenda says the mentor mentee presentation. We were hoping to be able to acknowledge him, but I just want to, to make a point of saying it really does have a huge impact on the participants. So if you're interested in serving, if you've got an area where you can provide expertise, we will be reaching out so you can be part of um, a, a growing network of mentorship possibilities. And then I'm actually going to turn it over, hopefully, to Keone. Okay, so a brief report. Well, my name is Keone. I am the um, alumni and friends of East West Center representative connected with the um, EWCPA board. So we represent um, the current membership of East West Center participants on campus in, in Manoa. Um, a few items that we'd just like to highlight. There's been about nine events that we've held um, on campus since our last update since the last meeting. We In April, we had an Earth Day cleanup. Um, we also had an EWCPA flea market, which was um, held in Halehalabai. We secondhand items and celebrating Earth Day. Um, in May, we held a botanical walk, walk through the UH campus. Um, we also, um, at Hale Halabai, we also um, tasted Middle Eastern sweets and celebrated Ramadan through an Eid um, event. Also on May 5th, we celebrated Spring Hope Puka at the Amin Center, celebrated those leaving the East West Center or ending their awards. Uh, three of our board members and uh, Carol Lee, who was formerly in my position, was um, they received um, the Distinguished Service Awards, um, which was great. We wanted to celebrate them. Um, in May, we had a boba refreshment study break during our finals exams, also at Hale Halavai. And later in May, after finals concluded, we had a, a fish pond restoration project at, uh, in Kaneohe, which we partnered with the Friends of East West Center um, to help uh, restore and rehabilitate the Heia fish pond. Um, thus far in June, we've had an ice cream Sunday social event to welcome a lot of visiting leadership program participants who are staying with us um, for short, short term in Hale Manoa over the summer. Um, so we held an event just to socialize and to get to meet some of them. And we also had a, held a cleanup in June. Um, coming up is a community building institute in August, and we look forward to welcoming more new uh, East West Center participants to our Ohana. That's the update on my end. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks to both of you for that uh, update and report. And uh, just a, one quick additional comment to that. Uh, uh, mentors, uh, you, all of you uh, have a, a vast amount of skills and experience. And if the last two years has taught us anything, it is that technology can help to have uh, mentors anywhere in the world uh, to help others who may need your specific skills. Um, if you have any challenges using technology, we are happy to help you understand how to do it, how to use Zoom, or how to use some of the other technological platforms to be an effective mentor. Uh, we can assist you with that. So don't 
don't not be a mentor because you don't feel like you're going to be able to connect with people. We can help you get around that. Um, and, and all of you, we would love to have you um, express interest and share your expertise, your many years of expertise and knowledge uh, with these up and coming folks. We also feel it's important as a uh, alumni association to, as you just heard from the report, um, uh, to help to welcome the younger uh, students who are on campus and make them feel welcome and bring them into an alumni uh, ohana, if you will, and think about uh, not only, uh, you know, get them, get them young, right? Get them while they're still in school, uh, get them while they're still studying and show them the value of our extended um, East West Center alumni family. So these are some of the important um, elements that, that we think about as an alumni board. And we would welcome your suggestions on how to do that further uh, or more completely uh, in the future if you have them. You can always reach out to, of course, Christina through email or uh, through Karen or Amanda Ellis, if you know Amanda, to uh, give us your suggestions. We welcome those. Uh, under other business today, there are three initiatives that we have been looking at um, now promoting and going forward to get more depth and understanding on. And I'd like to give the microphone to Karen Knudsen so she can uh, briefly take us through what those three initiatives are. Thank you, Lynn, and thank you to the rest of you for your, for your reports. Um, many of you here also had the opportunity to attend the media conference that just took place. Some of us were here in the morning as well, so you saw that overlap. We have an incredible number and reach of media across around the whole world. We have a media alumni uh, chapter, so we want to kind of bolster that and get that really focused and really get some initiatives going with them as a group. They are a tight group, as you've seen, they come together every two years and it's growing and growing. So we're wanting to focus how we can really maximize their influence and become an even more active chapter for the rest of us. These things will be ongoing and we'll keep you informed, but this is one area that we have identified. The other, the chapter leaders mentorship project, We'll be working with the chapter leaders to really develop this and see how the chapter leaders can help mentor, as Glenn was saying, and younger members, bring them on, mentor them so that there can be a transition of leadership. And that really takes working together with everyone, taking the, the skills of those who have served in, in leadership positions and the skills of our newer, younger members who have different kinds of skills and just developing the chapter leaders. So again, this is evolving. We look forward to working with all of the chapter leaders and chapter members may have ideas for these as well. The Alumni Action Fund proposal. As you saw, we only have $6,000 in our, in our fund right now. This organization, under the leadership of some people like Tsui and others, raised how much money, Tsui, did this organization raise? A million dollars? Yes, you did. I think you did. Well, I'm looking for, but anyway, this organization has the capacity to build the scholarship fund for students. And over the years, you folks have been so incredibly generous. And we want to figure out how we can do that to keep those younger folks able to come. Many of you have already have scholarships set up at the center and how can we just continue to tap that, grow that. So we will be thinking more about how to um, get this going again. And was there anything else with that we wanted to? I just know I was so impressed when I saw somebody stood up at a meeting and said, we have a goal, we want to take this forward. And they actually, they did it. It was pretty incredible. So, yep, Q&A, no. Okay, so anyway, these are some of the ideas. There will be a, a couple of others that we haven't put on here yet because we want to massage it a little bit. You may have ideas too that very important to your geographic area or to some of your colleagues. Please don't hesitate to reach out to actually any of us here because we would like to just keep this a really vibrant and growing, uh, keep the energy going. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And another thing we just want to mention is uh, we do have a lot of ideas here, but we need your help in solidifying them. One key element that, uh, that we always are interested in knowing more of is who is an alumni that is not registered 
with the East West Center. And Christina has been going through the registry roles uh, to try to make sure among each chapter or each city that we are capturing all of the alumni in that city uh, and we have a way to communicate with them, either emails or phone numbers or whatever, preferably emails. So if you know any former uh, EWC uh, program attendees who are not part of the Alumni Association, at least with their uh, contact details, please do um, either encourage them to share those with Christina, or if you can share them, that would be most welcome uh, as we continue to build our networks and continue to build programs and, and, uh, and our family. Now, but I wanted to call out Amy Agbiani. She is the, uh, has been the head of the mentorship program um, that I was talking about earlier and has done just incredible things and been able to make that transition during difficult times. So uh, now that I have been able to see her, it's nice to see you in person, Amy. And I just wanted to make sure that everyone recognized the hard work that she has done and continues to do for that program. Thanks, Tane. Uh, as we do uh, take a couple of questions, please do uh, give your name clearly, obviously, and, uh, and what program you were in, if you wouldn't mind doing that, what year. And um, I'll come to you just next. I think Bill is going to be first. And, and please do uh, keep your questions short-ish, uh, or if you have a, just a short comment, that would be great so we can make sure we get around the room. Here you go, Bill. Hi, I'm uh, Bill Armbruster, New York chapter leader. Uh, I, I was at the center 71 to 73. Not a question, but a suggestion. I liked the idea of this time of having the alumni and media uh, conferences together. And I suggest that you plan on doing so in the future. And also this morning, one of the journalists from Taiwan uh, suggested having the media conference next time in Taipei. And then I think Susan mentioned that you're, they were thinking of Sydney, but Taipei, I think, would be great. So just keep that in mind. Thank you, Bill. Inga Kendall Marancho. I'm with the Southern California chapter. And honestly, we've been very frustrated not knowing who was leaving the East West Center. So if that information could somehow be made available to us, one suggestion that was came out of our workshop was to offer housing and any any um, mentoring to new alumni in our region, we could do that as an offer to kind of entice them to contact us in addition. So we would really, really love that. The second thing happens to be development funding. Uh, I just discovered about 10 minutes ago that the, you know, the East West Center is not listed on GuideStar, which is the number one donation clearinghouse for donations from in employees in their corporation so they can have matching funds from the corporation. So that has been requested multiple times and it has not happened. So this is a tremendous way for us to help the, the, the center. We really want to help you grow. We really want to increase the number of scholarships. We want to do that. Thank you. Those are wonderful suggestions. Hello. Hi, everybody. I'm Najma from Bangladesh. One of the uh, problems that we face in Bangladesh, you know, chapter, is that we never get to know who is coming to uh, the East West Center from Bangladesh and who returns back to Bangladesh from here. So, our, you know, we need new blood in our chapter and uh, we are getting old. We have lost two active participants in the last two, three years. So we would like to have this information as soon as possible, you know, like after the return or when they come, because, you know, before they come, we could have a session together uh, to orient them, you know, before they leave their country to come to the East West Center. And also, uh, you know, they're very enthusiastic and bubbly when they go back, but then by the time we get to know about them, you know, and then invite them to attend a meeting or something, they have gone back to their own old routines or lives and they are not active anymore or not interested or you know they've gone back to their old routine so it would be really nice if we could you know grow because um, of course compared to the past nowadays we have fewer participants from bangladesh 
but if uh, you know whoever comes here joins the uh, Bangladesh chapter of the alumni association that would be so good and then there could be many things that we could do together thank you thank you very much Christina do you, uh, if any of you have any any short responses to any of the comments, please do, uh, you know, jump in if you'd like. You know, uh, folks, one of the challenges we have too is we do have to respect certain privacy issues, right, in terms of people's personal data. And, and so getting in touch with people sometimes is a challenge for the center if they don't have their uh, personal contacts. So you as members, if you have friends or people that you know, uh, and if you can help reach out to them, if we don't already have a way to contact them, that would be really useful for us uh, because we are in an age of, of privacy and data privacy. So we, have, we, we do have to tread carefully uh, sometimes around that. So far, the, the, uh, the suggestions you have are fantastic. Though. I'm Ari Brara from India. My question is, uh, how many um, chapters are active and how many are not active? And what are the thoughts to make those who are not active, active? Christina, do you wanna take a stab at that? In the audit that um, was completed just before I joined the Office of Alumni Engagement a year and a half ago, there was a, an audit, and I remember the pie chart, and it was about a third, a third, a third. Now, how that was defined as active, semi-active, and really not active <laughs> of the fifth at that time, there were fifty chapters. So, um, I'll, I'll say that that's at least the data around what that might look like. And your second question around, oh, how? So a major initiative was to start these chapter leadership workshops. Rather than every two years, we fly in one leader and pay for one leader's flight. And I know it was controversial to change that policy for this conference, but to use that money instead to um, foster a larger leadership cohort for the board members, not, not just an individual in every two years meeting, but quarterly. So starting this with, with Ramon and Bella, a quarterly workshop series and the chapters vote on what they think they need help with. So the first one was intergenerational collaboration, was awesome. Three chapters gave really specific ideas around those. And then this next one they wanted to know about, you wanted to know about, I see many chapter leaders here in the audience from French Polynesia, one of our newest chapters, Manuya, nice they wanted to know how to use social media tools so i think it's more regular contact and more sharing across chapters at least that's what i'm hearing <laughs> so um and so i'm trying to feed back data and listen more but i think your colleagues as well know best how that's going to happen yeah Thanks, christina sorry. did you say there are 55 zero chapters how many chapters? 50 Three. 53 yeah. chapters and about a third are very active a third are somewhat and a third are not active at all right okay Thank you. Thank you for the question. Did you have a question? Well, my question was going to be very similar to what's being discussed now. I was very disappointed this morning that the two chapters that I, my husband and I were very active in at one time were not even represented. Those are Chicago and Arizona. Um, you know, we cannot be chapter leaders forever. We left the East West Center 55 years ago. And during that time, you know, we spent a lot of time, effort, trying to uh, keep up with ac different activities. But we need younger people to carry on. We tried and we did not succeed in finding anyone. My question is, do you have a way of resurrecting dormant chapters? Actually, Atsue, I don't know that there's anything right now, but I do know that we, the Arizona chapter used to be active, so you're right. We need to reach out. Actually, that is something we can write down and we can look at and then try to get back to you. So, because that is unfortunate when chapters do close, but you're right, Chicago, we have a lot of alumni there. Arizona, we know, wasn't Linda Miller? Some, we had uh, active uh, people there in, in Arizona as well. So I think that's something uh, that Christina in her new role will be looking at. 
Yeah. Can I just, before we go, Gary Yoshida, who all of you know, was a longtime development officer at the East West Center, just came up. He has an answer to the Guide Star question. He Googled it right now and how East West Center is on there. But I asked him to just handle this question right away. Um, the Guide Star question, actually, East West Center is under the technical name, Center for Cultural and Technical Interchange, rather than East West Center. Yeah, rather than East West Center. And then East West Center Foundation is a separate uh, 501c nonprofit. So, so where was that? I was the administrator when I was at the East West Center. Maybe so, that's something that could go in the news, the next newsletter, uh, maybe making it more clear for everybody how to find that. Yeah. Uh, sorry, yeah. Thank you so much for that update. That's so helpful because if we can get that to every single alum, not just the retirees, but especially the ones that are currently hired, <laughs> that will be helpful. The other thing that's been suggested is that there be a hook in the scholarship to the recipients that they don't get the last check until they make a contact with their chapters. We'll pass that along. <laughs> I mean, it's simple. Okay, thank you for that. We do have a question from online as well. Uh, can you go ahead and give us that question from the back of the room? Okay, so on media linkages, current crises need the brainstorming acumen and access to public which media members are blessed with. For example, extreme financial, socio-political collapse in Sri Lanka just now. So the question, do East West Center affiliates actively link through their East West Center network with their respective foreign correspondence clubs to enhance effectiveness. FCCJ current president happens to be Sri Lankan who had earlier mobilized our unit and others for post 2005 tsunami support events. This is from Tim Hoffman. Thank you. And, and that's something I don't think we know right now, but that is something we could bring up either to the new media chapter or also touch base with our, the head of our media program to see that that would be something that probably individually they would do, chapters would do, we know for instance, when the uh, tsunami uh, hit Tonga, it was a chapter leader who took the lead on doing fundraising. So, and then working with local media, but thank you. Our we'll final question. Okay, it's gonna be one, two, three. And I'm gonna say the last one first, which is I wanna thank all of you for everything you do. When uh, as a chapter leader for many decades and now Inga is our chapter leader and Jay Brar. And everyone in the chapter, in a sense, is a leader. Uh, we want to thank you for your cooperation, and we understand the limitations with privacy and such. But somehow or other, it's easier to get people to want to agree than it is to try and get around that privacy later on. OK. Um, it's easier, it would seem to me, to get one organization that lists how you can donate and get matching funds to get them to change the word to East West Center than it is to get the word out to 50,000 plus people. Okay. And um, the other reason I think we've tried, for, our chapter has tried for years to try and get younger generation in is that that younger generation changed as the center did to APLP chapters or media chapters, they identify not so much by their geographic place of living as they or origin as they identify by their disciplines. So maybe we're trying to do something that needs to grow in a different direction. And once again, thank you. And the conferences bring us all together. So keep that up. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. All right, great suggestions. Um, any other further comments from any of you up on the panel about the questions we've heard? All right. Uh, notes have been taken on everything you guys have mentioned, and we do appreciate that. We know that without all of you here, uh, our most ardent supporters who have come to this meeting today, uh, that the uh, organization uh, you know, needs all of you and many more as well. Uh, this is going to bring to a close our our, um, our executive board meeting today. Our next meeting is October the 20th and 21st, 2022. If you have further questions or comments, uh, please go ahead and submit them to Christina or to Karen Knudsen or Amanda Ellis. 
We, are, uh, we want to have help from you and we want not just suggestions, but we want people who are also gonna do a little bit of lifting too, um, because uh, we need your help and we need this to be a grassroots uh, effort as much as a one driven by the East West Center. So with that, I will uh, close this board meeting. Thank you very much. Here with me we have Ghana. She was the award recipient for today. And Ghana, would you mind introducing yourself to the virtual audience? Sure. My name is Ghana Purovjo. I um, came from Mongolia. I'm the, the Changing Faces Program alumni of 2014. Nice. And you have founded the Ghana Bell Institute. Would you mind also sharing briefly information to the audience about what exactly is Ghana Bell Institute? Ghana in uh, Spanish is uh, victory. So bell, you know, it's kind of uh, bell for success. So our vision is to help the individual to become successful and uh, help the Mongolian SMEs to become international companies through the human resource empowerment. So we are specialized in human resource management and um, uh, coaching and mentorship. I see. And, and what type of mentorship and coaching do you implement through the Ghana Institute? And, and who are your targeted groups? Our target group is uh, individuals uh, overall in Mongolia and also the small uh, medium enterprises. So we help them to empower, to become the uh, good leadership and great uh, business people. So we help them how to increase their productivity nice. and how to empower their, and how to improve the competitiveness in the region and the sector. Oh, that's awesome. That's a wonderful program. And also I know that you have uh, created the digital school. Yes. Would you mind sharing how that is connected to Annabelle Institute and what exactly is the digital school? Okay, this digital school idea came from the thanks to the COVID, you know, always problem always bring the new opportunities. So once every all whole country was locked down, we came up the solution to establish the digital school. So digital school is to design to uh, spread out the leadership program, whole region and whole uh, provinces of Mongolia. So we, well, with the assistance of the East West Center, we were able to run nationwide uh, adaptive leadership program through 21 provinces of Mongolia. So it became the very big project and very impactful project. Thanks to that, 110 um, participants successfully graduated the program and became East West Center's alumni. Oh, wow, that sounds like an excellent program. Um, since you've received the award this afternoon and have seen a lot of your colleagues and alumni at the conference, do you have any final words to share or takeaways from this conference to share to our audience? You know, the, it was my great honor and lifetime memory to receive the Distinguished Alumni Award. And uh, during that the speech, I also mentioned that, you know, the life is all about the giving. The more you give, more you receive. So if you think what you can, if you give what you have, then you have plenty of things to give away. So today's conference is also the example of, you know, sharing the knowledge, sharing the experiences with each other and how we can uh, work together in the future. So it was the big networking event. So that uh, when I go, even though when I uh, meet one Indian guy, Indian alumni, he wanted to work with our digital school to collaborate, to expand our, you know, uh, activities. Got it. Thank you so much for taking the time to interview with me. And this is Panwin back to the studio. Aloha and welcome back. Um, I hope you had a really good session. I had a really 
Uh, fun time actually listening to the board meeting and like listening to the suggestions made and it was also really nice to see that there are also some engaged participants um virtually who also post um who also post questions to the rest of the group so yeah as as mentioned it's important to have your voice heard and i'm glad that your voice was indeed heard thank you so much we are going to um we are going to a few more interviews um, before we conclude and before we head on to the reception. But um, as for me, I just want to say thank you so much for tuning in with me. It's been really fun um, being your virtual host today. It's been an honor and I will see you tomorrow. There's going to be a lot of exciting um, things happening tomorrow and we hope to see you again. Take care and have a nice day. Welcome back, everyone. And it's me, Panwin, again. And I am here with Ace. Ace. That's right. We are here with Ace. He's originally from Thai as from Thailand as well. And if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you to briefly introduce yourself to the audience. So, สวัสดีครับ. Aloha. My name is Ace. I'm from Thailand, and I am an alumni of the SUSI program, the study of the United States Institute which occurred right here exactly 12 years ago in, in June 2010. That's awesome. And you're also part of the YSILI 2010, right? Can you explain how the YSILI program helped you to advance your career or your, your academic studies? So I was here for um, a month, right, in Hawaii and a week in DC. The program at the time was known as SUSI, which is now known as YSILI. Um, so YCLE stands for, for a lot of people that might not be knowing, YCLE stands for Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative, mm -hmm. which is a very active program that's occurring all across the ASEAN region. Right. And recently, President Biden also recently announced that he's increased the funding for the YCLE programs, just as, as we heard today mm -hmm. by Liz Allen. Right. So um, yeah, and I, I have to honestly say that the program has been very transformational, especially the one in Hawaii, among the other programs that I've been a part of. It has transformed us, I'm not just for myself, I can speak for my cohorts as well, in different, different ways that we've created very unique bonds while we were here. And also when we went back till today, we are creating and having the bonds. I'll just raise a small example if that's okay. So one of my friends, Ting Mamate or Tess, who is a volunteer teacher, she teaches an NGO with, and she's taught probably 5,000 students until now. So she recently came over to the house and we had dinner and everything together. So YSILI or SUSI program at the East West Center has had us a very, kept us a very warm group, you know, and we've been pretty tight, at least most of us, and has transformed us in many, many different ways, whether it's personally, professionally, you know, so we're forever indebted to the program actually. You know. That sounds great. And, and you're known as a young environmental leader in Southeast Asia. Can you explain to the audience briefly about the project related to the environment you're conducting or have been conducting? So I have to honestly admit as a disclaimer that now I'm a bit away from the environmental space, but I used to be and my friends used to be very, very active. So I remember after we left the environmental program in Hawaii, we started our own club at the university, where, which was Mahidon University International College. We started the Nature Lovers Club or NLC. So we started the club and the club has now probably five, six, seven, 800 members. And the club is now 11, 12 years old as well. And it's been going on ever since. Among that, I've been part of many, several other projects, environmental projects, whether it's cleaning up the coral reefs underwater, um, whether you're doing work on the land, we call it the coral reef restoration project. We also do simple things like beach cleanups, you know, things like that. But the very important thing is to understand and get a first-hand experience of how the impact is in other parts of the world and resonating that with the impacts happening in your own country. So you feel like there is a collective effort that's required. So we work together as a network. And even today, coming here after 12 long years, I still feel very much part of the land, this land here known as Hawaii. That's awesome. That sounds like a very impactful project. And you've, you've mentioned that you've diverged away from the environment. So what, what have you been doing? most recently? So I run my own businesses. I have two, three businesses that are run. Uh, rather on the more interesting side, I think the more interesting business would be coaching or um, you know, leadership training, public communication, communications, and making sure that we get the right message across as much as possible and people feel as comfortable as they can be in front of cameras. So even if you had 10 other cameras here, I would feel as comfortable as I am right now. 
So that's one of the more interesting things that I do. So business consulting, communications teaching, leadership coaching along those lines. Wow, that's awesome. That, that is quite different from the environmental initiatives that you were a part of. One last question is any takeaways for, to share with the audience from this conference that, you, that you've gained? Definitely, there's a lot actually. I have been part of the IMC or the International Media Conference, um, which has occurred here you know, for the past three days. I found that very transformational as well. And today we're, you know, we've seeped into the alumni conference. So that has also been very, very nice. I have to say that I've met a lot of people from different, different backgrounds, different news agencies, NGOs, nonprofits, and each of them carries so much value and, and, and they bring the stories where you hear about their struggles. So that really makes you realize that these guys are the real heroes, you know? Right. So you really have a lot of respect for them. And thanks to East West Center, of course, you know, the East West Center for bringing us all together, connecting the East and the West, no matter where you are from. So I think East West Center has a huge role to play. I cannot emphasize enough that today I was talking to the director as well of the Graduate Fellow Program. And I was just trying to reinforce the fact that we're in such a position where the East West Center has a very important role to play especially in today's times when the, when the conflict is, seems very polarizing, whether it's China, US, you know, whichever part you may be, right? It seems very polarizing or even within the United States itself. So I think East West Center is very important to come in, set the pace, a platform where people can connect and calm down and, and move forward together as, as a global community. Yeah. Got it. Thank you so much, Ace, for taking the time to interview with us. We have to end this session here. And this is Kanwin back to the studio. And aloha and welcome. We're joined today by a very special guest, a distinguished alumni of our Young Pacific Leaders Program, also of the International Visitors Leadership Program and the Pacific Island Leadership, Leadership Program as well. And none other than Manuya Maiti, she's president of the French Polynesia chapter. Welcome to Honolulu. So great to see you here. Thank you. Yeah. Can you share with us a little bit of uh, some of the work you've been doing? Of course, you're an alumni, but you've also been doing some interesting things in French Polynesia. Tell us a little bit about it. Yes, so I'm the founder of Tahiti Art Press, which mm -hmm. is a small business that is trying to put in place to, to put in place uh, an online marketplace so that our handcraft people in French Polynesia can have international exposure and then um, grow sustainably their incomes. Mm -hmm. And then I have also um, a nonprofit organization called Tupu that is running the Academy for Women Entrepreneurs back in French Polynesia. Last year, we've been to Bora Bora and Orea, two different islands that was very badly impacted by tourism. So people needed to have another um, an alternative on incomes. And then we've been there to train them on how to build their businesses. Excellent. Well, that's very important, of course. Many of the challenges faced by a lot of countries is how to get more women involved in entrepreneurship. And this is very valuable for you to be sharing this. And here at the, at the conference, have you taken away any, have you had any, I don't know, interesting insights, any experience you can share, something you've learned here? Of course, um, because I am an alumni of East West Center, I was, I was able to join the two conferences. They, international media conference and the alumni conference which is a great opportunity for me i know nothing about journalism but being in this conference brought so much things to light about the um, the issues in the region regarding climate change peace misinformation so so many aspects that we don't really get to touch when we are not insiders so it's very interesting and then to have different perspectives from different people around the world. It's very enriching too. Excellent. Well, we're so grateful for you coming to share some of your own experience, right? Because you've now been working uh, in many areas, like you've said, both fostering entrepreneurship, particularly for women, but even some of your nonprofit work, just sharing more of your own culture, right? Uh, getting more of French Polynesia out to the world. Uh, and beyond that, anything, you, uh, from, how long was it since you were in Hawaii uh, from your last time? Um, Last time was one month ago. Ah, oh, okay. So you've just come back. Uh, but other than that, can you share any other takeaways? Have you had a chance to, you know, see other alumni that you were here with before or otherwise? So 
I met new people. I haven't met alumni that are new before, uh -huh. okay. but it was great to meet the, uh, the stuff that I knew and then connect again. And it was really interesting to meet new people, to get in touch and connect really um, family with them. It's like uh, this morning, a friend from Fiji called me Gigi, which is would mean sister in Hindi. Okay, very yeah. well. So it's really like you said, it's all about building and rebuilding these connections. Uh, you you came here and now you've come back to reconnect with many of them. And for us, it's been very exciting. We're grateful for your insights, uh, what you've shared with us. And obviously, you'll go away, I think, with a valuable experience here, right? Well, thank you so much. Any sure, other thoughts? And, and I would like to add that uh, because I'm here for the conference, I was also able to have lunch today with the Undersecretary Liz Allen, uh, with my fellows from YPL today. It was really interesting to meet the other uh, people that I didn't know before and hear their experiences, their stories, and how they tackle issues on the ground. And it was really interesting to be able to share uh, our challenges and what we are grateful for to Undersecretary Liz Allen. Excellent. Well, I'm so glad you shared that. And of course, Liz Allen is uh, the government official here representing the State Department. And uh, you had a chance to meet with her to showcase, really, she's here to see people like yourself who are alumni of these programs. It's all about people to people exchanges, right? Well, we're so grateful, Manuia, for you sharing some of these and, and coming all the way from French Polynesia back to Honolulu. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take it back now. Thank you again. Uh, joined here by Manuia Maiti of French Polynesia. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.